Hi everyone, welcome to the Car Chat Podcast. I am Sam Moores and with us today we have Colin Hode. Hello. Hello. Hello Sam. <laughs> welcome. Can you tell the audience a little bit about just sort of a short summary of who you are and what you do? Yes, I'd love to. I'm founder and director of CAC Driver Training based at UTAC Milbury Proving Ground. And we've been providing driver development services for the last 20 years when uh, Joe and I founded the company. Nice, nice. So let's sort of do a little bit of a wind back and your journey to this point, because presumably you can't just one day turn around and go, I want to find a founder driver development company. I mean, you could, but you probably have to have some sort of background in this space. So what's your, what's your sort of journey been? Shall I go right back this? to when I left school? Would that be a good place to Yeah, yeah, to yeah, start? yeah. Let's, let's yeah, go quite, back. I think I've evolved into the role based on, unwittingly, based on, on my history. Um, I left school and I did an engineering apprenticeship with Rolls-Royce, so that was aero engines. So mm. at the time, a fantastic thing to do. Um, so that gave me an engineering, an understanding of engineering that really the pinnacle, the highest level, it was aero engines. So mm. you start to understand the, how quality engineering works and the relevance of it all because people's lives are, you know, in your hands, literally. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that was my introduction into engineering. But prior to that, uh, as a young man, as a child, my dad was an engineer toolmaker. He ran engineering firms. And then he used to take me to watch motorsport, which is really probably a common thread in many people's history. <laughs> yeah. uh, no surprise, I went on to do oval racing, but my dad used to take me to, I am now really showing my age, White City Stadium um, in in London. And they had oval racing there. And really? Re yeah, honestly. Yeah, White City Stadium was... It's gone now. It's houses, but um, they used to, it used to be like Wimbledon Stadium. So oh, sick! And I can remember I was eight or nine years old, and Graham Hill uh, came to view the racing. Was in the pits talking to people that were doing stock car racing and oval racing. So oh, cool. there I was as a young lad sitting there looking at one of my idols, looking up at my <laughs> idols. So there's a there. Oh, I've gone back a long way there, haven't I? So that was kind of the introduction. Uh, yeah. And as as a young lad, I was really into cars. My dad used to buy motoring news. He obviously read it and I, I would read it. So really, there you go, eight years old, into cars, as a lot of us are, you know, whizzing around with Sky Electrics in the lounge. Yeah. Went to Rolls-Royce and that, as I said, got me into engineering in, in, at the highest level. And then while I was an apprentice, a bit of a potted history, bear with me, while I was an apprentice, I started racing the Mini with the Rolls-Royce Apprentice Association. Oh, so cool. if, if I now look back, I mean, it was a complete shed. And it was, <laughs> you know, there was no demon tweets. You didn't just buy things then. Yeah. You had to make it. So okay. it was all part of all that was aero engineering. They deemed it a good thing for us to be doing because we were building engines and making various things for the car to make it work and be reliable. So my indoctrination into motorsport was to actually, at the age of 18, was to jump in a mini and drive around bombing an airfield where they used to do hot rod and stock car and banger racing. So there you go. Yeah, that is there's... cool. As a as a scheme, I mean, I, I, do those sorts of things exist now? Do companies, you know, get their people and go, "Oh, it'd be helpful for you if you you went and learn a bit about the application of this." Let's go and build a race car. That's that sounds like a really cool project. It was at the time. I think if we go back into that that era, seventies, yeah. eighties. Then apprenticeships, we were more based on manufacturing. So apprenticeships were more involved and I think more common. Um, yeah. So that when I joined Rolls-Royce at Leeson in Watford, there was 4,000 people working there. And they had wow. their own training school, their own tech school. And it was all part and parcel of how Rolls-Royce operated. Whereas I think now a lot of it is outsourced to colleges and, and academies. So slightly different now, probably different unless you're... In well, let's take that a stage further. I think now what's available most sport degrees, most sport college um, courses to get yeah. you into engineering. So, yeah, a uh, formula student at universities. So, I think, yeah, it, it probably does evolve, but not in the sort of um, perhaps just the grassroots. Somebody had an idea at the tech school, yeah, let these yeah. guys do it, and that's exactly what happened. So, um, 
So that took me into motorsport. So now I'm at Rolls Royce. I've come out of my apprenticeship. I started racing. Yeah, I was 18. And then I used to work, if you worked at Rolls Royce during the day, then you could do a bit of moonlighting at the flight sheds at Leeds and Aerodrome. And then, okay. so I do think sometimes things are all mapped out for you. Aren't you? you don't know <laughs> at the time, but I look back and there's this sort of jigsaw puzzle I've sort of put together completely a lot of it just unbeknown to me my path is being mapped out um so i used to work at the flight sheds um, refurbishing aircraft weekends and part-time uh in the evenings and the guy that owned one of the companies i worked for said what are you doing at the weekend i said i'm racing a mini and he said oh i'd love to get into motor racing perhaps i could sponsor you can you believe that wow uh, and, that's, and that's what he did uh, so I worked for a company called HPB Aviation, and then once he realised I was into cars, and he was, he sponsored me for well, it was good four or five years. Um, yeah, I look back now and think, how did that happen? You know, that <laughs> yeah, just yeah. doesn't happen, does it? Someone just says, yeah, that sponsor you. Um, so I got into oval racing, uh, and latterly of that it sort of era in my life, a little bit of circuit racing. But I, ru- I ran out of money, money when he stopped sponsoring me. So yeah. Um, so I was enjoying myself. I was racing minis, over racing. I was building cars with my dad. We did a lot of engineering and, you know, cut the floors out and made beam axles and did all sorts of things. And that started to get me on the road to, well, actually, I'm really enjoying the engineering at Rolls Royce, but my passion's not there. Yeah. Um, and then I left, uh, much to my dad's annoyance because he was an engineer and he was proud of his young lad at, <laughs> at Rolls Royce. Um, I went to auto farm as a mechanic. Uh, oh, really? Time, yeah, at the time. Oh, okay. I'm going to say some names that you will know, clearly, because I <laughs> I take interest in your podcast and you've had some yeah. of the guests on the people I've worked for. So uh, I went to Auto Farm as a mechanic, and then that really got me into cars. So as yeah, you yeah. might be aware, they're into racing, hill climbing, circuit racing. Um, yeah. At the time, they did some really good stuff. They had a Group B911 that was all the things you remember, run by a company called Strandall Racing. I think it was a Swedish company. That was okay. a 33 Le Mans Turbo, and it blew an engine, and Auto Farm bought <laughs> it. And then we put the engine in, and then you've got these, you know, 3.5 RSs floating around and Le Mans yeah. cars, and I was absolutely in my element. So that then got me into engineering on cars. So okay, I had yeah, the yeah, yeah. Rolls-Royce engineering background. I fumbled through building race cars of my own, but... You know, I look back, they weren't that good, even though I yeah, thought yeah. I was doing a great job at the time. And then when you work professionally in the industry, it's like, oh, hang on, there's another whole world here I need to hook into. So I worked yeah. with some really good people, and, and people, you know, are still known now, Neil Brainbridge, Mike Brainbridge, people in the Porsche world that are, you know, synonymous with what they do and the success they've mm. had. So they were, if you like, my, my tutors then, because I was then quite young and being tutored and <laughs> getting on with Porsche world. Uh, I left there and I went to DK Engineering and I worked oh, there wow, okay. for Another. a spell as a, as a mechanic engineer. Technicians we're known as now, isn't it? So that people don't like the word mechanic, but that was the, <laughs> the word of the era. Yeah, um, yeah. And then I stayed there for a while and then I went to a company called Libra Motive. They've actually wound down now, but at the time, uh, my boss who ran Libra Motive, Rob Wells, was very successful in the Morgan world, prepped the Morgan factory cars, raced with Charles Morgan. Mm. Uh, I think they won the 24 hours at SNET, the wheel hire in, a, in MMC2, which was the factory plus eight. And then I went there after, shortly after that had all been happening and then had a very successful time with Rob for 12 years. Brilliant engineer. He was no doubt part of my learning and as a, as a mm. boss and a mentor. Uh, And we won many championships with names that are synonymous with GT racing now um, or have been. Some of those guys are now retired. Keith Arles, Rick Lloyd, people that did very well in in GT racing and historics. So I was there for 12 years and then I came off the Spanners and the workshop and then ran it as a manager and latterly became a director of it. So I'm now, am I painting an okay picture here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I want to, before we move uh, too far on i want to go back yeah. a little bit and dig go into a couple of things um they like oval racing i i don't really know much about oval racing okay. other than it's it driving it around an oval often i i were you doing in the minis was were you on dirt or were you on tarmac occasionally on shale dirt 
but it was flattened. Uh, so shale in the dry is dusty, but offers a high, quite high level of grip. Okay. So most of it was tarmac. Um, yeah, I was. You would race against significantly fast vehicles, so making a mini work. I got into minis, and then I got so far in, I couldn't come out because I didn't have the <laughs> money to transfer into escorts. Yeah. Um, Mark One, Mark Two Escorts, which then all steel engines then were significant money. Um, yeah. So an all steel engine in a Mark One Escort would produce about 185 brake in the era that okay. I was racing. You're on slick tyres, one seat, roll cage, lightened to the best of people's abilities. So Barry Lee, Duffy Collard, people, those were the names at the top end of the sport. I was more at the club level, so Bovingdon, yeah. Northampton. Uh, and then occasionally you'd be invited to the big events like the Best of Britain at, um, at Wimbledon and you'd be racing on shale. But most of it's tarmac. Uh, I race hot rods, which is supposedly non-contact. Um, <laughs> but your car, you build a beautiful car and you think, oh, I'm really proud of that. And within like two two events, two weekends, oh. the thing looks like a banger <laughs> car because people keep tapping you, banging you. So it's very close. Um, the thing that I enjoyed about it, which has really been a... Uh, a direction that's probably taken me where I've gone in terms of most of all is um, the intensity of it. So you're racing for a very short period of time in reality, about 20 minutes, but you could be out there with 30 cars and you're all on a very mm. small track. So what I got very used to doing was being comfortable, being around, um, being around lots of cars and actually racing. So overall yeah. racing is intense. It's fast. It's got faster and faster and faster. So even stock cars now are purpose-built. Like you know, They look like a Formula Ford if you start looking at the wishbones. Okay. And there's specialist companies that make them, and it's really raised its game over the last 20 years to a point it's no different to circuit racing in terms of its professionalism. Yeah. Uh, you've still got banger racing and stock cars, so you could argue that's sort of grassroots and a bit more um, agricultural, but they become proper pieces of kit. Uh, mm. So, yeah, that's what I did. So you're racing on a quarter-mile oval with anything from 15 to 30 cars. You're on slicks. You're setting the car up like a circuit racer, but it has to be a bit stronger. So if you put a beam axle in a, a light and rear suspension set up in a circuit mini in that era, it was all very wafer-thin and light, whereas yeah. in an oval car, you're going to get tapped, banged, so you had to make a similar thing, but bit stronger a bit more solid yeah so you were more about durability and making it last perhaps rather than the ultimate lightweight car because if you made it too light you just snap a wheel off so yeah and you need to make it to the end <laughs> you gotta get to the end yeah and then people would intentionally the phrase was in oval racing give them a tap so they know you're there so if somebody <laughs> couldn't get past they give you a yeah. tap you know and then your car's got to be able to withstand that and you as a driver not sit there getting wound up you had to stay calm while people were you know, yeah. in some ways, trying to push you off the track. So when I look back, uh, it's a great introduction to circuit racing because yeah. you're, just, you're comfortable with cars around you and you don't mind getting close. So Yeah, and yeah. dealing with the pressure and stuff because I've done a, a bit of racing and various things and some radicals and stuff. And when I've, I've had it where the grid has been like 15 cars. Yeah. And it's very possible that you can get let's someone like Silverstone or something where you're not really that near it, it, it could string out where you're almost on a, just a very nice track day by yourself. <laughs> <That's right>. um, <laughs> yeah. And, yes. Uh, I'd agree with that. I can and, assure and you used to it. That never happens in oval racing. <laughs> yeah. It never happens because the better you get, the further back you start. So I got to red okay. grade. So you st uh, I forget the colours now. I think it's white, yellow, blue, red, and then the Euro the the club champion would be a gold roof or a silver. And then if you went into the big stuff, if you started doing the more you know the the international stuff, then you'd have a world champion with a checkered roof. And so the more points you accrue in the season, the further back you start, and then you've got to then have that in your thoughts that not only are you defending, you're attacking, and you're trying to do it without obviously. And there's no, the track. Is, is, there, is there any qualifying? Uh, no, you normally have, uh, in my day, you would race all of the races, but I think sometimes I think you now qualify, let's say through three heats and then the final, you get invited to race in the final if you do well in okay. the three heats. 
But, you know, there's a few names that we know that um, started in over racing. Martin Brundle, if yep. we think of him, you know, he often comments on that. And I went to watch somebody who raced at Bollingdon, a guy called Dave McMahon, who was racing in the World Championships. I went to Wimbledon, which is Shale, compressed hmm. Shale, to watch. I'm going back to the probably late 70s. And Derek Warwick was doing a demonstration drive in a Formula 3 car around an oval track at Wimbledon. <laughs> wow. I've never forgotten that. So he was sliding his Formula 3 car around on shale on slicks. So he oh, came wow. from oval racing. So That's cool. Yeah, and there's a lot of uh, touring car, BTCC. If you listen to the commentary, that's how they started in oval mm. racing. And it's a good intro. I think it still is because it, you know, it really teaches you car control. It teaches you how to race and how to... Uh, position your car, defend, attack, run close without hitting someone. I think it's a brilliant introduction to, to motorsport, yeah. Yeah, because you do, presumably, obviously, the car control and everything like that transfers very well to straight-up straight circuit racing. But are there, like, oval-specific sort of styles that are a bit different, or it's all of roughly um, just adjusting I've, parameters well i've not raced the current car so a current car like a the name that came into the four once we just stopped using saloon cars that we modified people like somehow yeah. preparation they started building tubular space frame cars uh, on slicks so now you're driving something that's designed to go around a corner which would be minimized input process uh, okay. optimizing tire grip whereas in my day it was more we used to run nine inch wide slicks on a mini so you can imagine the grip but the suspension was quite archaic even you had rose yeah. joints and things so the tire wasn't always quite flat on the ground okay whereas now you jump in a you know prepped car or a space run car they can make the tire stay on the ground through all yeah. the cornering activities so and what it has to do uh you couldn't a lot of people used to set the cars up because you're only going one way but then if you set your car up to go one way with corner weighting and stagger on the suspension, then when you want to overtake someone, it's really hard work. Uh, okay, yeah yeah, 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 So I always used to set my car up neutral, left or right. You could drive my car on a circuit, be that right or wrong. That's how I used to set it up at the time, and it used to serve me quite well. Um, yes, yeah, not – yeah, I think – as we, as the cars have evolved and become more complex, then the driving by driving on a circuit, you need to minimise input and be very tight. Yeah. Unnecessary input normally creates some kind of work for the tyre and suspension to do that costs you lap time. So, yeah, so I think it's evolved as it's, as circuit racing has evolved. So my my gut feel, having not sat in a modern car, yeah, but yes, it follows probably a lot of the circuit style techniques. But you've you've got to be quite brave because the only way to go quickly is to go around the outside of people very close to the barriers. Yeah. So you think of a speedway track when they get out in the dirt on the bikes, you know, yeah. you've got to, right, the only way I'm going to get past you is to go around the outside of you for three laps and make it work over time. So, yeah, I can remember frightening myself on numerous occasions that in order to overtake this car, I'm going to have to sit outside for three laps, which then yeah. they can push you off, they can run you into the barrier. Yeah, they can give you a little tap. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, brave or stupid is probably, you know, the way you could look at it. Yeah. Um, and when you're running, like, say, when you were driving and you were running slicks, did you were you able to sort of warm them up or was sort of we used to corner run... one a bit interesting there you go yeah that would be exactly that we used to run second hand formula three slicks that's what we ran at the time and the wets mm. were the same so i used to do really well in the wet i've got in my garage here at home i've got i've still i've just kept all the trophies not not um yeah i just couldn't bring myself to throw them away if i'm honest because yeah. they represented at the time yes and i think of the blood sweat and tears i've got about <laughs> 40 trophies sitting up on the shelf in my garage when I look back at cool. what they represented, that was complete and utter commitment, you know, for like six years to yeah. to get them. So I've never been able to quite bring myself to, you know, get rid of them. So they sit there. Um, yeah, sorry, Sam, just repeat the question for me. Um, it was slicks and whether they get warmed, you're able to warm Thank them you. up and therefore Thank corner you. one. <laughs> they were, uh, you uh, in the time that you had to get them warm, was only, it's only a quarter of a mile. So okay. you leave the pit lane, you do the normal, you know, make the tyres and the brakes work hard, come round to the start line, 
and then depending, it would be a standing start or a rolling start. You got literally a very, very short lap to warm the tyres. So the first two to three laps in any oval race, I always used to think it was high risk because if someone's yeah. going to spin, you've got nowhere to go. So, um, yeah, looking back, yeah, you're really getting me, me, me memory. I can feel my adrenaline starting to come <laughs> up now. Just, I don't know if you do that. You start thinking hard about something yeah, you did yeah. that was exciting, and then I can feel my adrenaline coming up now. At the, I used to sit there and just feel very nervous, and I was all right once the flag dropped. But, yeah, first few laps on cold tyres, but what it gave you was just this huge amount of grip relative to the type of car you were driving. You imagine a normal Mini Cooper S in the 70s with yeah. all the skinny tyres. Now I'm running on mm. these tyres. And we put a lot of effort into making them work. And, um, yeah, massive grip. Massive, massive grip. Yeah. And diving style. So with something like the Mini, with massive levels of grip, you pretty much keeping it pinned or um, <laughs> are you moving around was, quite a lot it was around 100 horsepower doesn't sound a lot now but if you had 100 horsepower in that era you were doing well uh the escorts had about 180 the anglia's escorts mark one's mark two is about 180 plus 190 and we were about 100 100 break in a mini i always did well in the wet because that was a leveler yeah. um and then no you had to break but you learnt. The back was heavy. the back was very light and very low. Yeah. If you ran the front of the car too low, the drive shafts went at a funny angle, and then you broke <laughs> the drive shafts. So okay. you had to try and get the car set right. You had the back very low, very firm, and then it was just a beam axle across the back. So all the floor had gone. You put an aluminium cover in, but all you've got is a bar, shock resorbers, radius arms going up and down, and it weighed yeah. nothing. I could pick the back of my mini up on my own. <laughs> So it was that light. So you made it very easy for the car to oversteer. And yeah. then, interestingly enough, when we teach left foot braking now, I learned to left foot brake and heel and toe when I was doing the racing at the mm. age from 18. So I can left foot brake very, very, I'm adapt, adept at that. Because at the age of 18, 19, I learned to left foot brake. So you brake the car into the turn and you'd always want the back just floating around while the front pulled you through. Yeah, so it was all, all the little sayings of the era were with the Mini, you just nailed the throttle and the bank just had to follow you. So, again, it was there was a bit more engineering it too than that. But if you can make the bank just slide a little and you yeah. power through the corners, um, that was the key. But it took, me, have... it took me two or three years to realise that. I was young, I had no experience. And there was a few good guys at the time, a guy called Kenny Knight, who raced minis, did all the European stuff. And he had a garage in a block that I used to rent to keep all my stuff in. And he was a, a real good mentor, great source of, of information. Yeah. And without his advice, I wouldn't have got as far up the, you know, a far back of the grid as we used to say in over yeah. racing quickly. <laughs> yeah, 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 so, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so what didn't it? You go to the back of the grid. The better you do, you go to the back. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get yeah. in the back. <laughs> exactly. That's quite funny. If you get to the back, you're doing well. Yeah, uh, I had yeah. A, a similar thing in. I've done a little bit of Citroen C1 racing. Oh so man, we've got one now and stuff. We'll have to cover that. Yeah, okay. Um, and that the guys I was with, a, a, a team called Prep Tech, who were very good at setting up the cars. Our cars were always they would rotate on the way in, and yeah. you started. I, I never got that much testing time we never really did any testing it was just like yeah. a tiny bit and then go racing and then try and work out how to get faster in the race for your, in, yeah. during the hours that you're doing it but for me it felt like you needed to get the back turning yeah then at least you're going in the right direction but get turn in get the back to the point where it's like going That's you know it. sort of you on the it. limit and then then work the front and off you go um you you've got it in one so if you transfer that back to the end of the 70s into the 80s that's how you drove my mini mm. exactly the same and then the c1 we're running one now i'm racing with my okay. son in the c1 oh so, nice yeah so uh yeah little add-ons that you can you're welcome here's an open invitation i'll say it on air if you'd like to come and have a test with us you're more than welcome i'd love you, to you'd I'd be love very to. very welcome but what you realize with the c1 i'm like the mini so if you yeah because it's got wide tires you have to be super sensitive on the steering even though there's a bit of mayhem going on around you, because yeah. if you wound on too much lock, those tyres would scrub, and that's that's yeah. your corner done. Similar ethos in a C1, but if you rotate the steering wheel till you find the the front just working, 
Now, rather than come off the gas, if, you, if you're understeering and you want to adjust the speed in the corner, and if you just wind on another five degrees, it understeers more. That kills the under, that allows you to kill a little bit of speed so that you don't okay. fall off the track without coming off the gas. Ah. So what you realise, what you realise is, what you just said is absolutely correct. You could add a little. You yeah. could say, right, I'm, if I keep my foot on the gas, I'm going to understeer off and run wide. So I'm going to go yeah. a little bit of input, and then the tyres start, you know, they're howling yeah. at you. Don't do this, but you've kept your foot on the gas. Ah. And then when you unwind, you accelerate out. You haven't lost the speed. So there's a nice. few little things. It's taken us a, a couple of seasons um, to get to that point to understand it all because you develop the car and then I was yeah. racing with friends originally and we shared a car and now I've had a car built and by Track Toys, that friend yeah. of Track Toys, and I'm racing with my son who announced he'd like to come racing with me last year. Oh, that's so cool. If, you, if you're going to take it seriously, let's build a car. So that's what we've done, yeah. Nice. So And then... Yeah, C one. So which? So have you been? Have you been racing? Have you for the last year in that? Yes, last, last few years. years. We started pre-COVID, and I raced with two friends, Phil Marsh and David Alstat, of both very competent drivers, good racers. David's won Porsche championships out in the states. Came for training a dozen years ago and become a very close friend. Phil Marsh, very mm. similar. Came a friend through coming to Cat. So my job at Cat has, uh, and the run in the business has been more than the sum of its parts. I've got some very close yeah. friends now through that. But we did some C1. We uh, raced in the 24 hours. That would have been 2019. Which uh, ones we, did you do then? Did, did we you did do... Silverstone 24 hours, Anglesey Race and Remembrance. Mm, and then nice. COVID came along. We did last year, we did Snetterton and Race and Remembrance. The guys did a few more. They started getting podiums. They got a podium at Pembury and, and were running well at Donington. Um, and then work commitments, I can't do too much. But yeah. this year with Mark, so we did Silverstone, uh, sorry, Sneston last year with the guys yeah. in the shared car. My son came on board and made up the driving uh, and did race to remembrance. And then this year, we tested our own car that Matt built in December last year. And now we're we're into it just Mark and I, but sharing the garage with the guys yeah. uh, and Matt's running the cars. So we did Snetterton a uh, few weeks back. That was the five hour. We're doing Brands Action in August, three hour. And then we got two, three hours of Snetterton in October. So we committed to those three. Might do a bit more. Let's see how the year yeah. goes. But we quoted fourth out of 57 at Snetterton. Nice. So really happy with that. Um, it's a bit of a family joke now because my son's sole intention is to beat me. So <laughs> he qualified as fifth. So I thought, oh, well, I'm not. Cracking. <laughs> and then I managed to get a few tenths on him and got us up to fourth, which he was quite seriously disappointed about. Actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, come on, we're fourth, you know. Um, <laughs> so that's quite good fun, the family banter. Um, we got a punch here and I'm 15 in and I got stranded at Williams. So we had to come back on a trap yeah. and then... Mark just needs a few signatures. So he did another hour in the car to get his signatures and then we yeah. retired the car. But hey, you know, as we say, that's motor racing, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's, it's, I, it's, I did, I've done Spa twice and Silverstone. And I might have even done it the year that 2019. Okay. It was, qualifying was in the wet. Well, it's always at night, but it was like torrential rain, I think, when I yeah. did it. Um, and in fact, the whole that race was familiar. just torrential rain um yeah. but it's i Did think one of the it? things it was so much fun i actually yeah. i was really glad that one the spa in the wet is, is okay you get used to it you learn i learned a lot that's that yeah. was one of the things about a three-hour stint in a car yeah a three-hour stint without even refueling is yeah. completely bonkers um and then i normally race rear-wheel drive stuff Okay. So racing um, something what, front wheel drive. And what have you race then? Uh, SR, so radical stuff. So SR1, yeah. I did two seasons cool. of SR1, and then I've done a few SR3 races, and I've got an SR3. Okay. Uh, I sort of hit pause on that because family want to buy a house. And yeah. also from doing some of the C1 racing, like the amount of time you get in the car driving Mm, versus the cost yeah, is exactly. is huge. And then also that point about like with your circuit racing, you've got 150 cars on track. Yeah. You're overtaking like 10 cars a lap if you're going yeah. reasonably quickly. Um, whereas 
Yes, I, I do like driving the Radical, and it, it's almost more for a personal technical skill development that yes. I want to keep driving it because it's different. It's the same, same, but different, but driving a lightweight prototype with downforce yep. and trying to get push it you know, further and further yep. is a skill that you can't learn really, well, you might disagree, apart from driving something with downforce that is lightweight and going agree. that fast. Yeah. Um, but doing the C1 racing, you go to these things and people go, oh, yeah, Citroen C1s, whatever, like blah, blah, blah. I had so much fun, so much fun doing that. And like the money wise, it's much cheaper. So you're not, you don't have this massive potential bill and the cars are a bit tougher Agreed. as well, like just lying there at the back of your head. Um, but if I found it so funny. when The first one we did was Spa, and I think we finished 12th. It was either 8th or 12th. And we were like, oh, out of 50 or something. And we're like, oh, sweet. Like, we got this. That's good. Well done. And we never managed to get anywhere near <laughs> close to that again. Because, <laughs> you know, we crashed or we got hit in or whatever, or blew up a gearbox or all those sorts of things. But I remember looking at the grid and then looking at the drivers on the grid. Yeah. And you're like, hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. <laughs> they race GT3 cars. They're a pro. Like, yeah, all those people exactly. in there. Yeah. Yeah. That's when you start doing your homework, you realize it doesn't matter what it is, there is no easy ride, is there? No. It doesn't matter what you race, unless you really do pick a sort of trophy hunting series, mm. you, you are going to have to work hard for a good result. Yeah. yeah. And C1 is no different. In the actual fact, I think any. Um, where the performance gains are so small and the margins are so small, I think any kind of one-make series generally means close racing and you need yeah. a thorough and knowledgeable understanding of the dynamic of the car and how to make it work and how to tune your driving to that vehicle. Um, nothing's easy, is it? But I think one-make driving, everything has to be optimised. Yeah. And that, I think, is, is synonymous with it. And that's part of the attraction. Yeah, so I said to my son, you need to do this first. If you want to move on to anything else, let's get you in this. Yeah. Now you're going to learn your trade and you're going to appreciate how to make a car work efficiently, which and is, yeah, where yeah. it is. And le like you have, everything happens quickly on track, no matter what car you're in. And even in a C1, you're cornering quite fast. Yeah. Um, but you do have a little bit more time, a little I bit agree. more time. To, yeah. to, to possibly make some corrections correct to keep yeah. yourself still That's possibly it. on the tarmac <laughs> yes i agree yeah we always say when customers we do a lot with customers that are going to learn to race and then go on to do it so we on my my idea is that the the general consensus i believe is that you should be racing something where the world isn't rushing past you so fast yeah that you can't function and yeah. then you can build into a radical, you can build into other formula. Um, and I've also, from my history of doing what I did, as I was touching on earlier, what I've experienced is the absolute negative side of that, where people have right. purchased very high performance cars, Porsche turbos of the yeah. era, raced it, crashed on their second event and never gone back to it because they frightened yeah. themselves and cost themselves a lot of money. So I think, um, I don't think there's a correlation between speed of car and enjoyment because you can race a no. C1 or respectfully said you can race a Radical. I think it goes but, the other way. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So when people say, I say to customers, you could race our C1. They say, oh, C1, I'm not sure that's exciting. I'll say, well, yeah, yeah. it is. And you're going to really enjoy it. So, um, but obviously people make their own choices. But yes, that's what I've gathered over the years that, it's not what you spend. It's actually what you're doing in the formula and how the formula is run, how it's policed, yeah. if the cars are even and equal. That's what makes a great championship. And it doesn't have to cost the earth to enjoy yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's a really interesting one. You, mu you must see it all the time of this, I would say, the typical route into racing from a, I don't know, middle-aged person or slightly older. They've got successful. They've got a bit of money and they've probably got a fast road car. And then you, I see it a lot at test days and track days and stuff. Someone might have, you know, there's a very shiny looking 48 FA8 Challenge car. 
you know, being run by Ferrari and yeah. you go up and you're like, oh, hey, how's it going? I'm like, yeah, cool. Like, I'm like, oh, you having fun? And they're like, oh, have you done much of this before? Like, no, no, <laughs> not at all. I bought a, I bought a, a 488 and then uh, I was speaking to my dealer and they're like, oh, do you want to get a race car? Because then we'll make loads of money off you. Um, <laughs> and they're like, yeah, that sounds fun. And you go, okay, because... I'll admit the reason I got a Radical is I had some nice road cars at the time and I wanted something that felt like it was going to be faster and different to my road cars. I didn't want, I didn't like the idea of racing something that was possibly slower, even though probably in the back of my head, I knew that maybe an MX-5 or something would be actually, or a C1 would be the way to go. But I think it takes a bit of time to learn that. I totally Um, agree with that. Yeah. And, and then you get in something like a, I, I know first time my SR1, that took me a long time to just get in the headspace. And mm. then definitely the SR3, when you start getting more downforce and just the G force is going up and stuff. You've, I found a, a typical example might be something like Magus Beckett's at Silverstone. Yeah. It, in, a, in a three, it's pretty much flat through the, at least the first section. Then it's kind of a lift for the left before yeah. the final right. And, and and change down but you you go through that first bit and you're like i know this is flat i know this is flat this is flat and you do the first bit and then it's almost as if the car has just driven off in front of you like five meters yeah. down the road and you're and you're sitting yeah. five meters behind it and you're, it's like a video game almost and then you're like there's a corner somewhere up there and your reactions <laughs> are, are sort of behind the car and then you're you you're way off and then you kind of almost have to like just you completely bail out because your brain just isn't yeah. in it yes um, i totally we face that and we work in that area daily mm. so how do you a, a gt3 rs on cup twos or pilot sport four s's that you're into the 1.4 g cup twos 1.5 yeah. g gt3 rs and then people say i want to drive it a grip limit well you've actually got to train your brain to understand what that means. What is 1.5 yeah. G? And then what you then realize, and I've, I've got more involved in the psychology of, of learning and driving as I've gone mm. through the years that I've been doing this job, same as my fellow instructors at CAT. But what I've, what you realize when I started this job, I used to think, well, I've told you what to do. Why aren't you doing it? Yeah, yes. literally. I think, well, I've told you what to do. Why aren't you doing it? That was yeah. in my head. And I can still remember thinking that rightly or wrongly and then as you start to evolve and you understand how we learn so i've done driving psychology courses at cranfield juni i've done professional coaching courses i've really got into it and then what you realize is we always say when we, we start with braking on the mile stroke generally uh, and and obviously that's to start understanding the dynamic of the car and how it breaks and the techniques involved but also what you're training your brain to do is most gt cars what you can pull longitudinally if it's 1.5 g in a corner you pull yeah. that on the straight and then you get into aero cars and it can be different. But what you're then doing in the braking at the very start of the day is your brain is saying, starting to say, ah, I know what 1.5 G feels like or whatever it okay. be, 1 G, 1.2. Then when you get to the cornering through all the exercise and into the afternoon, then what you realize is the customer might, our client might have learned how to do something. We've guided them. They've learned, they, we facilitate learning. We coach as well as instruct. So that's all happening. And then you get onto the circuit in the afternoon and I say, I'm just not quite sure where the grip is and how much grip I've got. And then my answer now is, well, you've explored it. You're starting to explore it, but your brain doesn't quite believe it yet. I've said you can go quicker, but your brain might need to repeat something a thousand times before it says, ah, okay, I'll let you do that. Mm. So what you see is the value in repetition and also correct practice so we can practice but we could get it wrong so let's make sure the practice is correct yeah. in the process so your muscle memory process timing technique but your brain needs lots of repetition and we're all different but if you start studying it you need you need a good number of repetitions before your brain will accept it so come back to your 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 anecdote there on the last corner if you did that a thousand times your brain would quite happily accept it and you do yeah. it but I think some of the issues, and coming back to where we talked about C1, some of the issues are, well, for me to do that a thousand times, it's not accruing a thousand laps on the Nürburgring. That's going to cost a yeah. lot of money. So it's finding ways to muscle memory and create technique yeah. that your brain is muscle memory, maybe not in an expensive environment. So just rotating the steering wheel once and looking through the corner, I can do that on the road. 
So yeah. if somebody comes for coaching and training on a course and they're learning to race, you say, okay, let's give you a plan. Let's give you a, a, a learning plan that includes some work on the road. Because all within the realms of the highway code, I can look ahead, I can rotate the hands, I can get the hands in the correct place, I can scan my environment, look ahead, scan back. I can do all that on the road. Now I'm starting to rack up the repetitions. Yeah. So perhaps when you get into your radical and you're going through Maggot Speckett's Chapel, well, I've got all this covered, the process. My brain's just got to get happy with that level of grip. Yeah. So, I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a, a great uh, listener there. I, I, I listen to that every day, and then we come up with ways to help people evolve. And it's normally that, getting repetition. Now, that's, your, that's a really good point and angle there. That I When I first sort of got into and started this bit of my goal with racing and stuff was was maybe have a bit of fun but also i kind of wanted to just build up my car driving skills to the level where i go i kind of wanted to be like i could get in a car and take someone for a lap around a track and then get out and go hmm, he's pretty good and yeah, actually okay. I've, re <laughs> I've realized like that if you're taking someone that has no appreciation, not as in that hasn't done much of it, it doesn't actually require that much to get to that point. Then it's yeah. like, but could I get in with a coach and then be like, hey, it's not bad. Like it's pretty decent. And then you're yeah. like, okay, how far can I get my Delta to a pro time? That's that. Yes. It, it, you sort of have these different, different goals. But when I first started, I wanted to do a huge part of I was where is it's cost. And yeah. you talk to someone, like a coach, and they'd say, well, what you need to do is do loads of testing. Like, okay, but I don't want to spend 100 grand a year on testing. No. And what can I do that will teach these, these parts, like you're saying, yes. whether it's working well or steering, that can break it down and learn these things as cost-effectively and as efficiently as possible. And... I've come across quite a few coaches now and yeah. a lot of them are coaching you on a track in a specific car to be fast. So I'm kind of like testing at the same time, which I've realized there is a lot in that, but that is you're basically kind of optimizing lap time and learning a bit. Yeah. And it's kind of an optimization process rather than a let's, let's, let's remove the track and let's yes. work on your core skills. Yes. And, I'm realizing that you need to do you need to do both. And you do. You totally learn. Do. Yeah. So if you look at, shall I jump in there with a with yeah. a with an example? So yeah, for example, for what we do six day academies, road track and race. We teach engineers how to test and evaluate cars. There's an overlap within those disciplines. But for us, let's take the steering technique. So what you start to realize is if you if you learn the core day day one single input steer, can we get around a corner? on one turn every corner. Yeah. If you're sub grip limit and not really pushing on too hard on every bend, that is achievable. So for the road, that is a core skill that you can replicate on every turn. Then we think about going racing and then we now think about hairpins, acute angle bends, low speed, medium speed. Same for an engineer testing vehicles. Then what you realize is if I straight line break for a corner, a road style, road craft, how we teach on the road, road craft, the police manual for advanced driving that all instructors for the road tend to use as their basis. That would insist that we break in a straight line, get on the gas and drive through the turn. And a car is at its most stable when driven forward. What that does is create understeer because when either front, middle, rear engine car, you lift the nose a little and if you power on, you would start to get some push at the front. So yeah. very safe and an excellent standard of driving that's safe and re repeatable for the road. So what you often find is if you take that style onto circuit, then you would realize that every corner you've got some push at the front. So now you're in a 911 with the engine in the back and the nose is lifted and you haven't trail brake. People say, well, the car doesn't go around a corner. No, so let's use yeah, yeah. trail braking. So then when you get to track, what you realize is single input steering will work on a faster corner you can define one radius until the car starts to slide and you go to work. But if you're on a hairpin or an acute angle bend, you'll be rotating the car in on the brakes. It's a vector. You're traveling forwards and sideways. So yeah. you need to manage the vector with the brake and steer. Now, what then happens is that people will tend to start to work the steering too hard. So what we would then teach, a customer came up with this phrase. If you work with other coaches, they call it hinting. 
we call it teasing the turn. But bear with me, I will get to the point. So, yeah, okay. So, as you turn in now, what you realise is, if I can just take up the flex in the suspension bush and the side wall of the tyre before I actually get to the point that I want to turn, so if I rotate the steering wheel just a few degrees, then rotate, that becomes then the technique that I need in any corner, but it actually gives me more grip because it introduces a slip angle to the tyre in the most refined way and you get maximum yeah. grip, you get less understeer. So what then starts to happen is that you, if you think of muscular skeletal, how we work, then if you've now introduced teasing the turn into your circuit driving, what it does is actually gets you thinking about what you're going to do to turn the car in. So you slow down your shoulders and you slow down the input, which okay. takes away that. Yes. So you get core skills, single input, then we get into the vector and then we start trail braking. And then normally about day two to say three, we're now into teasing the turn and it transforms a corner. If you if you do it in black oh. and white, yeah. So now what we then say to people who are going to race or engineers or somebody who wants to drive on a track, practice it on the road. So every corner that you go to, now think about teasing. If you even in a four eight eight Ferrari, drive down a straight road and rock the steering wheel a few degrees left and right, then there'll be something where the car doesn't respond. Yes. And whatever you drive, there's something. It might be one or two degrees. It, I've got an Austin A35 in my garage, a Speedwell race car. And if mm. you drive that car on track, you turn the steering wheel and take up the slack in the steering box. Then you take up the slack in the historic <laughs> tall tyre. And then the tiny little suspension bushes flex. So you're about eight degrees on the steering wheel and you're going down the straight. And then you turn for the corner. So yeah. there's always something. So now there's another example. You can take, tease the turn. And you can introduce that into your road driving. Yeah. And now what your brain is doing is just it's just muscle memory and that absolute finite adjustment on the steering. Yeah. So coming back to your point, there's lots that you can do. If you really get into this, there's lots you can do to perfect your driving technique on circuit without actually having to necessarily just get in the car and cost you yeah. lots of money. You can use computer games. You can use simulators. You can use visualization. You can sit and use the circuit, work the circuit in your mind. You could write a list of every corner, turning points. We all learn in different styles. Some like to read, some like to do, some like to just reflect on on information and then put it into mm. into action. So reading, writing, kinesthetic. Find the right style for you that optimizes your learning. We even do things like, well, bless him now, he's passed away, but for the school's still running, Phil Price Rally School in Wales, North Wales. We've been there, you know, meant like a dozen times, rent it out for two days with 10 customers. Yeah. And now that you're sliding around in Mark II Escorts, rear-wheel drive Subarus, muscle memory, reactions to control oversteer, yeah. manage understeer. So that's about £300 a head. <laughs> and yeah. you can have a day at Phil Price Rally School. So yeah. if you start fishing things out that give you that ability to start working, I'm, I absolutely follow that as part of our advice and how we train and how we facilitate mm. learning. Yeah, absolutely. You, you don't necessarily have to be sitting in that radical. Ultimately, you do. There is no question. But can I muscle memory technique that gives me more bandwidth than to – be more efficient in the, yeah. in the radical when I'm driving it. Absolutely. I I sort of tested that theory, basically. I did, let's say, I don't know, 16 months ago, I had a test. Um, and then four months ago, I had a test, Silverstone. And I was quicker on the second time. And I hadn't driven in between. Brilliant. Uh, Brilliant. I hadn't driven on track. But what I had done, and it's the bit that I find tricky is picking up and I'm slowly the more I talk to people and the more I try different learning with this person and that person and reading stuff and trying to apply it I'm trying to distill all of this learning and get it like sink it in because mm. I think it's very easy to go I'm going to go to a track and I'm going to do laps and I'm going to expect to get faster because yeah you, you're like, but why would you get faster unless you have a process for learning to Agreed. get faster Agreed. or you need to understand like you need to yeah. know how to be faster Correct. before you can be faster yeah and that's actually really difficult to get information on to, i'm bound to, to say it i'm bound to say it but if you come to people like ourselves we break it down 
Yeah. Uh, and the psychology is a big part of it. Mm. So I, my genuine belief is what we're looking to do is take away the subconscious input and the unknown. So I'll give you another example. If you ask somebody to do something that is challenging them, I'll, I'll give you a few clear examples. Most human beings, if you ask them to, I, I perhaps should go back a step. We've trained over around, well, it's on the website, and they're good numbers because every every certificate is logged, and we've been audited before. They're all good numbers. Yeah. It's not names we, numbers we picked out of a hat. We trained over 6,500 people. I trained That's around 300, 300 people at Nissan when I was a trainer there. We haven't got to that yet, but... That's how I got into this. Um, I've trained over 3,000 people. So what you have the benefit of seeing is human repetition. Mm. So what you start to realize as you, as you start to work with lots of people, we all are on a slightly different learning path, but there's synergies and parallels. One of which is I could almost guarantee if there's an emotional state change in the driver, the driver will do one or both of these things. They'll grip up the steering wheel tight. And yeah. they will look. They will look at the end of the bonnet. So yeah. the steering wheel. So I'll give you a very clear example. I was with somebody who's learning to race a Ginetta, and we were at Silverstone on a on a on a. It was a, a track day, and we were going into the corners a little quicker than this gentleman had ever done. So we're going down the back straight past the new pits. <laughs> exactly that. And then the car shimmied under braking. It had never done it before. Yeah. And then I knew my customer was a little bit anxious because he's not done this before. He's done lots of track yeah. days, but never gone in at one hundred and one percent. The yeah. car started to want, he knew the car would slide and we were working on that, building it up. And then the car fidgeted on the brakes and he said, oh, there's something wrong with the brakes. We're on the intercom. And I just said, how did, how did you get the steering wheel? He said, I was absolutely <laughs> murdered the steering wheel. <laughs> but then your brain looks down at the end of the bonnet. So your brain is always trying to steer you down there. So you start yeah. making aggressive or unnecessary inputs. Yeah. So you know, you know that humans are going to do certain things. Drive down the mile straight at Millbury. If you ask somebody to break to threshold from 70 and get on the pedal firmly, they'll do it to 70 and 80. But when they get to 90, the human brain says, oh, oh I'm not doing that. That's too yeah. dangerous. So you know, And what you then see is these changes in the driver's technique. And the key area that I'm really interested in is the subconscious. Because yeah. what you're really interested in when, when you're working is the bit the driver doesn't realize they've done. Yeah. So a car understeers, and most of us will just stick another 10 degrees of lock on, but they don't realize they've done it. So the car yeah, understeers okay, turning yeah. right, and instead of unwinding and going back, that's yeah, the correct yeah. technique, they just go 10 degrees more. So you see that all the time. And then I'll say, Hans, what did you do with the steering? I didn't do anything. So that's yeah. not me being clever. That's your brain, because you're engrossed yeah. in what you're doing. It's yeah. the subconscious bit that normally messes you up. So that's part of the psychology of all this is then looking at what are you actually doing. So coming back to the yeah. discussion point, you can look at you can look at the car you're in and its characteristics. You can look at the driving technique of the driver. You can look at the technique to optimize that car on that circuit on the day, and that might take us to other circuits where it's similar. You can look at the perhaps the difference in temperatures and the ambient temperature of the day and the surface of the circuit. But if you start, if we think of boxes and do a mind map of all the things that create what your aim is, mm. actually just saying, I want to go faster, generally speaking, you don't go faster because you're trying to go faster go rather <laughs> than, you do, you do, rather <laughs> than looking at the ways to go faster. Yes. So what we do, what we always do is structure it so it's broken down. You have to make your objectives achievable. Yeah. And then you have to work in a way that the client wants to learn. It's no good me, yeah. you know, forcing information on people. They say, well, I'm not taking that in. No, because I haven't worked out how you learn best. If you ask someone, have you worked out in life um, the most efficient way you learn, most people will, well, a good amount of people will say, I'm not sure, but a good amount of people will say, Yes, yeah, so I like to do, I like to, to give me all the information and then I'd like to practice it. So what we do is then the area, this is going to sound like a cell, but it's not, it's just fact. What we also do is teach you not just the how, but the why. So every single That's course, so important. It, it includes vehicle dynamics from compliance steer to bump steer to how tyres grip the road. We structure a corner into nine sections. We look at slip angle and slip angle maps. Virtually every course from road to tractor race to engineer includes this information. 
So then people can work out in the car why something is happening. Yes. So your your that desire to go quick actually there's a lot to it. So if we can formulate a plan, I also always say, hopefully this isn't sounding like an advert, Sam. Um, <laughs> I also say that we should be absolutely looking to explore the areas that need the work and leaving the things that don't need the work. Because yeah. virtually everybody that comes through the door, and you would be exactly the same, and I'm happy to explore that with you. If you come to me, I'd happily go through this with you. What I'm interested in is what you know already. And what I think is sometimes missed is we get customers that have done stunt, stunt aerobatics, uh, people that race bikes, cars, people that do hot air ballooning, cycling, mountain biking, motorbike racing. And then when you start digging, even horse riding, if someone is a good horse rider and does a venting, yeah. that I've heard people say to me, oh, it's just the same as horse riding. If you go over a jump and want to go right, but you look left, the horse goes yeah. left. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, 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 even though you're pulling on the reins, the whole, I think, ah, oh, that's the car you're in now. Yeah. So take the skills that you've got through your horse riding and your eventing, and let's take what we can from that. Because your brain's already mapped to do that. Yeah. We haven't got to change the map. So what you realise when you do this job, if you dig into them and you're interested in people, quite often you will no doubt have skills that have you've learnt in in other forms of experience of perhaps sport or life that you can then adapt to what you're doing. So we do quite a lot of digging because what you realize is sometimes you just might open a door for somebody to learn and create a learning outcome that they've taken something they already know. So when you get nervous, you you start yeah. looking too short. And then a pilot said to me, ah, we call that, it was an airline pilot. He said, that's called coning in <laughs> on a pilot. That's coning in. I said, how do you, how do you, Get over that problem if you're engrossed in something. So oh, you've got to keep looking out, not go in the cockpit, because that's where the safety is. Yeah. Okay, right, we've got that. We don't need to work on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can skip that and move on to something else. You might need to refine it or change it for cars, but yeah, there's a lot in it. You're 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 saying all the things to me that we hear quite on a regular basis. So our job is to take what you know, and then the things you want to develop, yeah. and then make sure we do it in the most efficient way. So. Yeah, but that's there, it. There's lots of boxes. <laughs> there's so many boxes. Yeah. And I think the the psychology side is really interesting. And I think it's often not covered at all. It's it's like a this is a technical thing, and once you can do the technical stuff, yeah, blah, 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 blah. But I know personally, for me, for example, in the wet, like I'm not that confident in the wet. Like, and I understand the vague like concepts of how to drive in the wet and line differences and stuff like that. And I think yeah. it's a bit of rep repetition, but until it's, the, it's the confidence that you can do it. And I think I was on a track day, a track day at spa and funnily enough, it rained and I had a, had my M2 at the time. I was there, I was there with BAC mono, but I had my M2 as That's well. Nice. I was like, yeah, I was like okay. I'm going to go day, yeah. out. Um, yeah, that was, that was really cool to be invited to go and, and do that. Um, but I was like, okay, Look, in your head, you know, let's say in a radical, that a wet lap time might be seven seconds slower than a dry lap time. And you're doing 30 seconds slower. And yep. I, for a long time, thought, I just need to drive faster. It was that, it was that thing of like, yes. yeah, but you just need to knock 20 seconds off. Just go yeah. and do it. Just. And Yeah, exactly. And then yeah. I realized with the, with the M2, I was like, okay, what you need to do is you need to get some laps under your belt. Just go and drive around at a speed you think is comfortable. And slowly, slowly, just, just accept that you're going to drive around 40 seconds off the pace, whatever. But if you drive around that, chances are you'll start to work on the little bits and pieces. But then I get in my radical and the, I, the problem I have in the dry, it's a similar sort of thing, is it's all up here. Uh, there's yeah. a, there's 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 small you know refinements here and there to be a bit faster and adjust and slight technique stuff and whatever. But the main difference I'm driving five seconds a lap f slower than I have previously yeah. is I'm not on it yet, and it's like my brain is not in the mode that's like break at the point you know you can break. Like yeah, you can break at the fifty meter board or whatever. You break at the fifty. 
and it'll be fine. Like you can do it. You could probably break later, yes. but I'm breaking it up. Like for the first 20 minutes, two yeah. hours of the day, pick of the day, it depends. I'm breaking it 150 <laughs> for, for what? no yeah. idea. And then by the end of the day, I'm in the zone. Yeah. And I'm just pushing and it's going like the, the times just go. Doosh, 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 doosh. Yeah. But I'm not getting a full day of productive driving because I'm not in that bit yet. Uh, you, you, or you could argue that I'm not. I would, I come at that at a slightly different angle. Yeah. So um, the first phrase that came into my head was think the action, not the result. Yeah. So think of what you need to do to get the result, not the result. That's way more proficient yeah. and efficient. So if you think I want to shave 10 seconds off my lap, then let's That's sit down and work helpful. out how we're going to do that rather than just saying I'm going to shave 10 seconds off my lap. Also that you touched on, you made an interesting comment there. I'll get on to some other things. Um, but what you said is I can break at the 50 meter board. What we could also consider is, which is often not discussed, is where am I going to finish my braking? So there are some practical things you can do in the car that will assist you in going quicker. So what we would teach is how we teach engineers. A lot of this is also the style that you teach engineers to test and evaluate cars. Mm. So it's about protecting the asset, but you might need to drive it around the Nürburgring at grip limit. So we, yeah. we, we have a slightly different format that works in motorsport. It's just psychology. So let's not just think about the point that we're going to break from. I, I'm very interested and often way more interested in the point you're going to finish because the complex bit is the vector as you rotate the steering wheel or maybe not in the wet. Yeah. So what you've then got, we could have simply have a discussion on that. And when you ask, we, we get around um, eight to 10 people a year coming to improve their braking. And I can guarantee that half of those people, there's nothing wrong with their braking. They're not observing correctly. So they call yeah. it, their brain doesn't know what's coming up. When you work on the yeah. observation, the braking takes care of itself. So sometimes you have to go dig in and work your way through to find out where the root issue is that you want to develop. But, so that, that's on a, on a practical basis. But let me give you an example. Um, we, the, the last engineer that I taught to, well, I, I, I'll go back again. When I was at Nissan testing vehicles, you'd get a specialist over grip limit driver come from, from Japan, get in okay. the car and just power slide it. They'd never been in it. They just power slide it. Yeah. And, and I look, used to look and think, I want to be able to do that. And I definitely yeah. can't. It would take me, I'd be spinning 20 <laughs> times before I actually get it sideways. And then it would take me another half to be yeah. able to power slide it. And I didn't have the information I have now. I was just in there as a test and evaluation driver before I came a trainer at Nissan. But I used to sit in awe of these people because mm. I used to think, how can they do that? It's just such a skilled job. But what it also is, is training your brain to do a cognitive task that doesn't always relate to driving skill. So if you want to drift the car, I, I can, you know, next customer that comes through the door might challenge me on this and I'll make a jump of myself, but I can drift any car. So someone says, can you give me a demo? Yeah. Yeah, no problem. I always say the same thing. I might spin two to three times and then I'll do it because yeah. my brain's got to map the steering response. If it's a car I know, no problem. If it's a bit quirky or it's on yeah. something super grippy, I might spin it because I've got to learn the steering response, the throttle response and the grip level. All right, I've got that now. I can drift it. If it's something yeah. like an M3, you just get in and do it. But and I always say it to clients, it's not necessarily that I'm a great driver. It's that my brain has mapped a cognitive task like juggling balls. Yeah. So what happens when you, just like a professional racing driver gets in a car and does a quick lap within two to three laps? Yes. A test engineer is the same. So if you might have 20 engineers, you might be exploring the concept of a vehicle and developing a certain characteristic. You might have a manager, a group of specialist engineers in Japan. You, uh, in Nissan, we used to have engineers, four or five specialist engineers come over. You'd have to get in the car and perform on it. We used to say, like you're doing racing, you've got to be on it straight away. You yeah. can't say to 20 people, give us a couple of hours and I'll be with you. So yeah. you've just got to get in and do it. And then what I've realized over the years is the more you muscle memory all this, the more that cognitive task becomes a furrow in your brain that you can just walk the path, yeah. the easier it is. So I, I'm listening to you. I'm, I'm deep listening to you. And your desire, a lot of it is based on just simple repetition. Yeah. So the last, and I just nearly touched on this without giving you that background. The last engineer I taught to do over grip limit ride and handling, and that's becoming, 
not a dying art, but not so many people need to do it because now in the industry we've got computer simulations, computer modelling. We can run very accurate simulations. So a lot of the actual, you know, bum on seat driving is reducing. But the last uh, engineer that we trained to do over limit ride and handling, that was eight full days at Millbrook, eight half days at Millbrook and on the public highway. And then the gentleman had um, mentoring with a professional driver within his employment for a year. And yeah. we signed him off at the correct standard after a year. Now, when that person came on day one, they had a good uh, core skill, driving skill, but they couldn't they couldn't do all the ISO exercises, the test and evaluation work that you need to do, the repeatability, the consistency, drive robotically. Yeah. You know where I'm going with this. After a year of absolutely nailing it many, many times and working through it, I see that gentleman now at Millbrook on the handling circuit in the car he's never driven, just pounding round doing the thing. <laughs> I go fishing with him occasionally, actually. He's become a friend. So... Where you are, I think, is all about putting yourself in that scenario where you can just muscle memory. So I think what yeah. is what I'm always at pains to make people realise, it's within you. It's within you. It's not yeah. something you're not going to achieve. It's just you haven't had the luxury of being able to do it many, many times. So it's about empowering people as well because I don't like this industry to be something that's unreachable. That's our job is to yeah. make it reachable and teach you how to get there in the most efficient way. So... When I hear, you know, my son's been the same. It's been a fantastic, fantastic experience for me because mm. my son's very motivated. And now I've got access to somebody that normally the customer ways you could buy. We have emails, you have conversations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But my son, you know, he's, he's not embarrassed. He'll have me for two <laughs> hours on the phone after a test. It's like every night for two hours, you know. Yeah. And we dig, 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 dig. And then my son's nearly there. He's going to beat me. I think he'll beat me this year, but he hasn't yet, which, as I said earlier, he's a bit irritated at in the <laughs> nicest way. But I know he's coming. Yeah. And then the last thing I think I said to him after our download from Snetterton, don't force the speed because it's sensory. Yeah. It's haptic. It's what you do with your hands, what you smell, mm. what you feel, how you load the car, how it feels. If you start thinking about how a car works, because you're an engineer – you can feel bump damping, the rise and fall of the unsprung weight. You'll feel that in your chest. Rebound yeah. damping, you'll feel in your head, like a giddy feeling in your head. So okay. what you realise yeah. when you do professional evaluation and tests, a lot of what you're doing is sensing how your body's reacting to the input. Yeah. And then what we t we take that and we put that into our race instruction, our track day instruction, and that's where my son is. He's going to beat me. I know he will, and I'll be happy when he does it. But you can't force that. Yeah. Because it's about your brain logging. And then saying, well, I've logged that. I don't really have to think too hard about that because yeah. I know I'm going to do it subconsciously correctly. Now perhaps I can move on to something else that I do need to log. And then you just, I call it, it's a bit cheesy, I call it climbing grip mountain. You're just constantly going up steps until yeah. you get to the top. Now sometimes yeah. you get stuck on a step and you think, right, you're stuck on a step. Let's analyse that. Why are we stuck? Ask the question, why are we stuck? And then when they give you the answer, you say, okay, why are we stuck? You keep yeah. digging. And then quite often, our clients will come up with their own answers because what you need is what you're feeling, what are you sensing, what you're not feeling, what you're not sensing. And you can make that very prescriptive. Mm. And what you realise is as, uh, that's why I describe it. You, you find that, that level on the step on the right, you think, ah, oh, there's another comparable step I can make. If I get this right, I'm going to climb another step up the mountain. Yeah. And then all you're doing is working up steps till you get to the point where you want to be. And it is different for all of us. And that's why I totally respect when somebody says, mm, that's not working for me. I need to think of it another way. I totally get that. Yeah. So then you've got to manage the information in another way to help them get it. But yes. it always comes, it always comes back to, it comes back to repetition, but you can repeat what, and I believe in, um, I believe in data logging, but we wouldn't touch a data logger until you've done three, four, five days with us because all you're then doing is repeating me. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily work. It will work for some, and if that's the way you learn, that's fine because that's another learning style. But what you tend to find is with data logging, you need a competent skill set to then make use of the data logger. Yeah, you need so, to know all the stuff that's going on that's not shown in your data logger. Yes, because it doesn't give you the feedback and the feel that your body's experienced. It's yeah. objective data. And then you learn that. What I'd also learned in this end, because you're teaching people to test and evaluate cars, and I used to do it professionally for them, is there's no right or wrong because we all sense information and input in a slightly different okay, way. Yeah. 
So when you sit in the car and you say the car is doing this, when I started at Nissan, I was in the in the meeting. So you're in there with like four or five drivers and a, and a lead engineer, and they say somebody say the car is doing X. I think no, it's not. It's doing Y. Yeah. How can you think it's doing X? And that's what I thought all the time I was yeah. at Nissan. So I haven't got this twenty years of experience from what I now do. And then yeah. I say, oh no, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I'm not arrogant. I hope. Um, but now, totally different. Because I think, yeah, you're, what you're sensing is different to what I'm sensing. Yeah. That's why Nissan, all manufacturers do it. They do customer clinics. So you'll, you'll have a parameter. You'll have a design intent. You'll have the car that's aimed at a certain specific market and a person. And then they'll do, you know, they'll give the car to 10 people when it's near pre, you know, production and they'll get their feedback. And then yeah, you, you don't want in, just engineers' feedback. You need the person that's going to be using it out in the field, don't they, and buying it. So. That's- I find that oh, there's so many things that uh, when I start off and I, I move on to this, but you're, I think a lot of people look at sort of, I don't know, driving us, like you build a solid base and let's say it's a wide triangle and then you chip away and your, maybe your lap time gets smaller. But actually in what we've just been talking about, I feel like it's almost for a lot of it, it's flipped the other way around. It's like your capacity for accepting and understanding information is tiny at the beginning. It's like, when you take someone to a track, let's say Silverstone, and they go and they do a track day, and they've never done a track day before, and they go to track day at Silverstone, and you go, how well do you know Silverstone? They're like, yeah, 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 great. It's got like, whatever. I don't know how many corners it's got. 10 corners or something. I should probably know that. 17, uh, but yeah, 18, yeah. 18 corners. And they go, it's a right and it's a left. And then you talk to someone who's done 500 laps. And you go, how well do you know Silverstone? They're like, pretty well, but like, hmm there's still stuff there's still stuff and you look at what they're looking at and it it, it goes from this yeah it's a right to a actually the tire surface on the inside curb go. on this particular go. one foot gap is slightly grippier than this other bit and your yeah. your capacity to look at that information when you're driving you have to log the time and you have to do the steps but the things you're thinking about, and I, I was a ski instructor for a bit. Ah, and so you must have parallels. Yeah. So yeah, there's always, there's always these sort of things. And I, I've definitely look at it in my driving now, but you, you know, someone's basic and you go, can you do this particular task? Like get round a corner or skiing, carving or something. And then you start to look at how you're loading your in skiing it's like how you're loading your feet how you're loading the edges and it's there's actually a lot of parallels now that i think about it with yeah, this like, you know hinting and yeah. turning and stuff it's like yeah you're you're preloading the weight on the ski before you yeah. then start managing the edge and then you're like basically pressuring the front and then you feel it move to the middle and then the back and but to do all that stuff you have to be aware that even that there is pressure in one foot or the other Yep. And you can then, that really taught me that there is so much to learn in everything. That yes. like you can break it down and break it down and break it down. And I, skiing, I think is a particularly good one for people to do like six weeks and then go, yeah, I'm great. There's nothing, I can, I can get down a black run or whatever. And then they don't look at someone that's done, I don't know. F- 50 years of professional skiing yes. and going they're still thinking when they're going down yes. the slope they're still You've thinking about stuff but it's like tiny 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 That's little it. things but to That's them it. it's massive yes yeah and it's the I same I totally driving. agree with that statement yeah totally and I think to um, become competent at any anything from horse riding to skiing to driving a car I think it's also we could look at the I'm also interested in the motivation, the internal. Mm. Is it in, are you internally motivated? Are you doing it because your friend does track days? Are you externally motivated? And then what I'm also interested in, in a, in a pleasant way, not in a um, not in a discriminatory way or you know a, a judgment way, but people's ego. Yeah. Because then what you realise, if you look at the psychology of how we operate, ego keeps us alive. It keeps us imaginative. It keeps us healthy. Um, it keeps us motivated, but also if, our, if, we're, if we're heavily ego driven, then the ego has a louder voice perhaps than the learning voice. And you, yeah. I think if we can, if you want to be at your top of your game at any sport, those steps up the mountain, they might become more finite, but at the bottom, there's, there's many areas that we can explore that might yeah. not be obvious. And if you've not 
perhaps taught or been in an environment where you've put yourself in a position of learning, I think some people can say, oh, simulator, no, I'm not interested in that. Or mm. hydration. You know, how many times do people do a track day and they go with their friends and why shouldn't they? Yeah. You know, they're at spa in the, in the, more than ring in the blau ecker and they're having five pints of beer and you know that happens doesn't it and then you wonder why yeah. you don't feel quite right the next day when you're driving around the nurburgring you know so just diet how we look after ourselves our health our fitness hydration i work with a professional england rugby player i've, I've had a lot of we've been graced with a lot of advice and i you, one minute you're a coach and the next minute you're a student all on the same day yeah and then we had a professional english rugby player came uh, for training he did a couple of days with us and then at the end of it he said to me you don't drink enough Colin he said you're dehydrated he said you feel tired I said yeah I feel exhausted about four o'clock he said oh you need to hydrate and he said read there you go you yeah, know I've got my cup here he said he said read go on this website read this book and I've had years of that from professional people in other arenas that have given me yeah. really sound advice so hydration if you're dehydrated by one to two percent and this is factual scientifically pro proven you can be 15 to 20 percent down on your concentration levels yeah so what you it's think huge. is it's huge it's huge and then what you then realize is actually this 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 uh hobby if you're driving as a hobby professionally you just want to drive safely on the highway the bits that we might just not consider are sometimes very important so yeah, yeah, yeah. if you're working on a strategy to become proficient at track for track days, there are a few things that just might be, you know, off piece that you're mentioning and people think, Oh, I've never thought of that. Mm. Um, yeah, do a track day at Snetson on a summer's day. I was, you know, I'm there regularly at different tracks and then you think, well, I just need to get, you know, I always take a cool box and I'm drinking a hot day. I'll drink three or four bottles of water. Cause I know I'm going to yeah. get dehydrated. Whereas go back 10 years, I probably wouldn't have bothered. And I'll just yeah. have a drink when I get home or a cup of tea at lunchtime. So I think if we get into this 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 world, what I also believe has happened is if you look at the grid of a BTCC race, all those skills like tyre power ride, most of those cars are running on individual tyre pressures worked out through the air volume and heat of the tyre on that circuit on the day. Now, we run that in yeah. C1. Matt does tyre pyro on our C1. And the difference between it being par road and not, it's like driving a different car, literally. Really? Yeah, so well, I can imagine. Just, but yeah. yeah, yeah. So then you think to get to the front, that's like writing the list. How am I going to yeah. get to the front at C1? I'm absolutely anal on it all. So, you know, I yeah. want everything how I want it, and I want it right, and it isn't going to – I'm not going to get in that car unless it is right. Yeah. And I've just got to that point in my life. I've been engineering cars, you know, since I was 18. and I, just, I wouldn't even get in a car if it wasn't right. There's no point. It has to be right in my heart, I think, no, that's right, I can do something with this now. Even if I'm not up to the car, yeah. I want it right because then I can rise to the occasion and I know it's safe and it's going to work. Yeah, and if but, you've got the tool in the state that it needs to be in, yes. like, you then you can at least, like, drop, like we were talking way back before we've got heavily sidetracked yes. off this whole stuff about the mini and the setup so that it, you know, yeah. you turn in and the back comes around. If yeah. you're car turns in and the back doesn't come round you might as well just put it back in the garage because like you got it literally got what it. is the point yeah exactly that so i think um i think what i've learned also is if you've and, and it clearly applies to other sports i'm just not in those sports and those mm. activities but a lot of people in our world have have a degree of discipline because they've they've worked out that to do track days to race to compete to do well or just enjoy yourself safely there is an element of discipline. Yeah. And I, I really do find it interesting when you speak with clients and how they're going to, you know, I, I know a lot of people in the industry. I'm going to add you to my list now, and you're welcome to come for C1 or a day with me. But when you start working with different people, you know, Abbey Motorsport, the track day providers, track toys, when yeah. you start working with all Chris Franklin, Centre Gravity, who's, who, who's very popular in the Porsche world and set up, when you start listening to how these people have evolved often they found motorsport and they found discipline yeah and i think when you have that ethos you start to uh, it's, if i'm going to do something like our business if i'm going to do it yeah. i'm going to do it well or i'm not going to yeah. bother yeah what's the and point i think yeah exactly so i think you take that into life don't you whether that's yeah, you yeah, know yeah. i go cart fishing i'm trying to do it to the best of my ability i say try because i don't think i'm brilliant at it but 
I, it's the intent that matters. The intent, that's the word. Yeah, I've got the intent to do this properly. And I used to go just to sit there and enjoy myself, and now I go there to catch fish, and there's a complete difference. And I think yeah. I can see the parallel between somebody going for a track day to a race to enjoy their race or to win. There is a difference. Yeah. I do. All, I will add, I've got total respect for the people that just want to go and enjoy themselves because yeah. that's that's what they're there for, and I promote that. But if you want to win, what I was going to, my point I was going to make is everything that's in Formula One, Formula Two, Formula Three, British touring cars, what it's really done is just disseminated down into C1 racing. <laughs> like your comment, you look at the grid and you think, yeah, 150 GT. cars. Yeah, Tom Ingram was racing one, I think, at the Race of Remembrance. Yeah. And then you think, hang on a minute. If they're doing that, they must require a degree of excellence. So that must mean the team they're, work, they're running with yeah. is giving them excellence. So yeah. that's, how I've, that's how I view our initiative. People say, I want to come into motorsport, and they say, I'm going to pick a, a junior formula. You think, yeah, absolutely fine. But be aware that the people at the front of that junior formula probably the team is, <laughs> Exactly. They take it seriously. And they've got lots of knowledge, which we've all got access to in, in a greater or lesser form. Um, yeah, that's that's kind of where I, I sit with it all. But uh, it's, yeah, I've gone off on a bit of a tangent really, there. It is, it is so interesting, though. Like, I, I don't necessarily know, actually. If I'm racing, I want to be able to... I have to be able to be in with a chance of... Yes. I, I don't like the idea, for example, like if I got in my Radical, and one of the reasons I've not raced it very much, other than time and money, which is a huge one, um, but that I don't want to race my SR3 until I know I can set a lap time that's roughly, I don't know, let's say within the top five, six cars, if there's 25 okay. cars. Like, I, to me, there is no point in trying to race other people if I can't actually do the lap time that I want to do before. Yeah. So, yeah. like, it, like, how do I expect to do well? Yeah. You now, you might learn a bit on the racetrack, etc. But, like, like we've talked about earlier, if I don't understand how to be faster, and I can't do that independent of having someone on my ass or sitting on someone's bumper yeah. 120 miles an hour turning into a corner... How on earth am I going to have the capacity, etc., to deliver what I want out of the race, like at all? It's just not going to happen. I, I hear you. Yeah, if you look at that as a statement, then I always, I'm a great believer in making your objectives achievable. So, is that an achievable of a, achievable objective? The other question I'd ask you is why that is the criteria. Yeah, and well, that might take a bit of thinking about, but then. If you and I should let you answer the question. If you if you think why am I doing this, and then you keep digging. Once you've answered yourself, ask it again. Yeah. Why? Then what why? you quite off? Yeah, exactly. And then you get the answer. You you think okay, let's go again. Why? I've got the answer, but I think there might be another one. There might be a yeah. deeper motivation. So it's once you start digging, perhaps you could then set um, an achievable objective that would allow you to get to your goal. Yeah. The, which might be a different formula. Totally, totally. And that's uh, when I found, did some C1 racing, that put through a real spanner in, I'm sure. in the works. Yeah. Because your, your thing about asking why a few times, um, I've, I've, I've come across it before in, in various elements of life. And I'm you, sure, go, yeah. you ask it like five times. If you yeah. ask the same person why, and you say why to their answer five times, yeah. you get to the most horrendously deep, dark stuff. <laughs> very quickly like, you do exactly like, and they're like yeah. oh because my I don't know like I, I, nobody I was, loved me I was Ayrton Senna when I was 12 years old and yeah. I want to be Ayrton Senna but I didn't have the money and I've got this you know I'm a frustrated yeah. racing driver talking about myself now yeah yeah, yeah exactly. exactly and then and then it just gets deeper and deeper and deeper and you wind it back and you go that's I think an element of where the ego comes in Exactly. Because you might go, no, I want to be a, an amazing racing driver, whatever, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But actually, the real reason why you want to do it is nothing to do with that whatsoever. And yes. what are you yeah. trying to satisfy? Because yeah. I think a lot of it, for the for, for the person that suddenly starts off and they're like, oh, they bought the most expensive car they can afford and they want to race that yeah. just, just for like the kudos, the badge, all the stuff. 
You're like, well, what are you actually trying to achieve out of here? Yeah. Chances are you're going to, if for most people, funds are limited to some extent. Yeah, now yes. each person has their own category yeah. that they're in. They could be That's right. a GTE car at Le Mans and they're blowing yeah. a million pounds in a weekend. Agreed. But like, it's very easy to just buffer up against that straight away. And I found yeah. that with me, I was like, I've got this budget and then immediately you're like pushed up against it and you're like, well, I'm not yeah. actually having any more fun. So maybe no, that's, that's I a could good, spend less. That's a good point. I think also what we could do, if you came to me with that objective, my question would be, how should we get there? Clearly, I'm going to ask you that, and we'd spend time discussing it. But and we could talk about the motivations and the whys. But if you're coming through the door and that's that's the logical step that you've chosen to take, I would accept that. But then yeah. our job is to say, okay, you've got an objective. Let's make it achievable. So where's your lap time now? And you'll give me a lap time. The car you're driving, who's setting up the car? Is it a professional race team or is it yourself? What's your budget for tyres for testing? Can we get a representative uh, laps on the amount of heat cycles you've got a budget for from the tyres? Yeah. So we can ask some very practical, objective questions, and then we could we could get coaching and say, okay, well you're you're, you're 15 seconds off the pace uh, around a long circuit. We know that on a shorter circuit or a bigger circuit, the time that the will change is, yeah. is, is, is multiplied, amplified. The deficit is is multiplied. So if we came to a circuit and we can have a difference between Brands Hatch, Indy and Silverstone, and you might want to be within two seconds of the fastest lap at Brands and, say, four seconds at Silverstone Grand Prix, we could then put a plan in place. Okay, what budget have you got? I can do three tests and I can do three races this year. What can we expect to achieve? What percentage increase do you think you'd be happy with? Because actually my job now is to coach and help you through that. So I would say... Can, by the end of this year, let's work on, let's have objectives. So whenever anybody first races with us, we ask what they would like from the day. They do the training. They, they normally got their own car, but occasionally we're putting cars on for people to race. And we have a mantra for their first race. 100% finish, 100% safety. Yeah. There's no point yeah. falling off on the first corner. And you're not going to learn anything if you're sitting in the pits with a smashed car. Yeah. So the mantra is, we take the ego away, but if you ask somebody what they want from their first race, you normally get the same answer. I'd like to not come last, I'd like to enjoy myself, and I'd like to feel like I've done well. Those are the things you hear yeah. all the time. I don't want to come last. And I think most of our customers never come last, and they do well on their first day. They might come 19th out of 24 or 22 out of 26. These yeah. are the numbers we get. But what you've then got is a, you've got a learning program, an objective. So at the end of your first season in your car and you've done three races and three test sessions, we could perhaps agree on what we would consider to be through your learning program an achievable objective. Yeah. So if I'm, say, 15 seconds off the pace, okay, at the end of this year, we think we can get down to, through all the work we're going to do in this structured format, let's say we can get within seven seconds of the fastest lap. Yeah. And then you can run through that year and think, well, I've done it. I've achieved. I've, yeah. I'm empowered. And I know how I've got there. Very important. Mm-hmm. I know how I've got there. Right. Session, year two, year three. We're happy to run with year two. Let's take two seconds off of this. How are we going to do that? And then we could look at your telemetry. We could look at your objectives. We could look at your learning style, what you know, what you don't know, where there's holes in your learning, where there's areas that you haven't quite absorbed correctly and you need to develop. And that doesn't have to be on the racetrack. That might be you doing some work with us and driving home at 30 miles an hour practicing this. So yeah. what I think the ego comes back in, it's, why can't I do this? I'm into cars. I've owned this. I've owned that. I've done 50 track days. I should be able to do this. And then my brain is, when people say that to me, I'm, I'm, I'm now, okay, let's, let's unpick let's, this. Let's unpick this. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. So we've had people that have done track days and they drive around and I've got no comp, a lot of our clients do this, and I'm, I'm totally in favour of it. How do you – you buy a 488 Ferrari, you can't enjoy it really on the road. You've got to do track days. So if someone wants to come and drive at 70% on a track day, yeah, go for it because you're going to enjoy your car, you're going to enhance the learning yeah. experience. So that, that person could have done 20 track days over five years but always at 70%. And then they come and they say, I want to go racing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they say, well, I've done, I've done 20 track days and I'll drive a Ferrari. Yeah, but okay, let's contextualise this. How does that relate to racing? So I think what we're always looking to do is to look at the objective, the yeah. objective information and contextualise it and make it real. Let's, let's make it real. What does it mean to you? 
what are your goals? What are your objectives? What's your finances? Have you got the budget to do this? Should we be in this series? I had a customer at the Racing Ferrari Challenge, and he smiled when he came to me. He said, you're racing in C1? And he said, he said How I took the corner off the car. I got hit by a car on, in the 24 hours. And I think that cost us about £800 for the drive shaft, the yeah. upright, the labour, the wheel, the tyre. And then my customer said to me, if you have a, if you take a corner off in a C1, what does it cost you? I said, oh, 500, 800 pounds. And then he said, if you take a corner off in a Ferrari challenge car, it's a minimum of 25 K. Yeah. And then the discussion was, are you having more fun than me? And I said, well, I, I've, you know, I've driven Ferrari challenge cars. I've helped people race them and they're fantastic, but that's a really hard one to answer because I'm having a ball in that C1. Yeah. And, you know, you go into Riches at Snetterton, and that's 88, 89, 90 miles an hour if you come down the straight well. Yeah, yeah. The previous corner, and the whole thing's sliding and working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Isn't it? You know that. And you might you have a car you... on the outside, you might have a car on the exactly. inside. Exactly. And a slow, slower car right in the yeah. zone that you want to be. <laughs> you think, oh, crikey, I've got to get down there, and I've got to get past him, and he's going to take me if I pull out, and I can't slow, I've got to do this. Yeah. Yeah, so that big game of chess... It's still at 90 miles an hour. Cops Corner is eight, same, same, 88 to 90 in yeah. RC1 into Cops. Now, if you're doing that with six other cars, you, you'd have That's to quite be... interesting. <laughs> exactly. You'd have to be a very, very, very seasoned racer, wouldn't you, not to find that exciting. I'm not yeah. saying the hangar straight's exciting. You have to suffer that, but... Put the radio on. I, I, yeah, <laughs> I take the whole thing in context. So, um, yeah, we sidetracked again, haven't we? But... Ah, yeah, yeah, so the whole coming point. back to it, yeah, make it objective. Make it objective. I hear you. But if you start digging into a little bit of thought about you, why do I? Why am I setting that objective in my radical? And what, what is so important about that? Well, let's take what's important and find a way then to achieve it. Yeah. But just, we're all guys, aren't we? We all just think, hey, we should be able to do this. But actually, if you break yeah. it down and look at the emotional content and the psychology of it, it it generally comes back to the same thing yeah we, we've had people come we've had brick car champions that have come to find three tents around silverstone so what we work on a lot with racing drivers is engineering they want to understand how cars work right yeah, yeah in yeah. order to improve their performance so we teach them like we teach engineers and that's a lot all our all our academies are the same but when you work with you can tell if somebody's eager driven or they're there to go, just go quicker. Give me all the information I need to go quicker. This is my objective. So if somebody's a little egotistical because they're doing it to beat someone, you've really got to, we're not psychologists, but you really want to dig in there and say, okay, there's a blocker here. What's stopping us doing that? Oh, I want to beat this guy. He beat me two two seasons. He's been quicker. Uh, he cut me up two seasons ago and I'm not forgiven. You know, all that. When you start getting into that, you think... You're not racing them. (laughs) No, You're racing yourself. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. You know that. You know that. But I'm not putting myself on a pedestal. I'm definitely not a psychologist, but I can link psychology to the job that I do. Yeah. And then I've got an interest in it. Yeah. That that point about learning the engineering side, I find really interesting because I've had different different driver coaches sometimes, you know, availability and whatnot, and some are more technically. I'm always my general attitude now is I can I want to learn. I basically I feel like the job of a driver coach or a coach or any sort of coach in any thing, instructor, whatever, is there should be a plan to remove themselves from the situation. Bang like, on. In a certain amount of time and a certain amount of lessons and whatever, they should yep. basically be irrelevant because they've passed on all the information on. that you need and you can do it. And a lot yeah. do not do that. No, I or agree. Or a lot of people being taught do not want that. Agreed. They just want to be told. That's another side of the coin. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. There's two yeah. sides. yeah. Yeah, I agree with that statement. I would also say I'm not just being politically correct. There's a lot of great instructors out there, and there is. So I would put that stake in the ground. But what I think we need to be – so if you you put it into its most basic form, if you employ somebody to teach you something, two things need to happen. It needs to be value for money, and they need to teach you what you want to know. That's the – in my mind, that's the bottom line. So then depending on what you want to learn, you pick the instructor that you feel can do that and you spend time to explore that so that you get the right person. 
if you then think about what you're saying is you need to empower people and hand the information on so that they mm. feel comfortable to do it themselves. And I think you also need to make it prescriptive so they've got a plan to follow that relates to their learning style, how they learn in the time they want to learn it in. But I believe you also need to explore the concept of how that person is as a human being in order to then help them, as you've just said, is then do it on their own. Yeah. And that is why my customers, some of my customers say, I want to beat you. And I say, I'm absolutely fine with that. And they look at me and go, really? <laughs> like my son. No, I totally am. I genuinely I mean, am. It's, it's basically heart. your job to make him faster than you, isn't it? Exactly. Like? <laughs> exactly. So if I've done it, I think well, I've done my job properly. Yeah. And if my customer says, oh, well, that's your lap time. I say, well done. That's great. And they say, how do you feel about that? I say, fantastic. Really? Yeah, yeah no, really. Yes, because you're <laughs> doing it. I've got some customers at the moment that are doing a lot of work with me on track and they they want an amount of time with me on track so that they can really nail it and move forward. So I'm doing four or five, six, seven, eight track days with them over two years. That's all planned and in the diary. I'm fine with that. But the goal is I'm going to get out of the car at the end of the last hour and you're going to run on your own. Let's yeah. get used to handing the information on. So if you coach somebody, you need to hand it on. Yeah, It's your information. It's not mine anymore. It's yours. Yeah, and yeah, you're yeah. empowered to use that information. So that's absolutely key. Some customers will say, I think I'll do one track day with you to get going after the work at Millbrook. I'll see you in six months once I've done half a dozen track days. Just yeah. make sure I'm on the right path. Fantastic. So you just take it as it comes. You you facilitate their learning in the most efficient way based on their needs and aims and objectives. So that's, I think, the, the role of a very good coach is to, or a, a proficient coach or somebody who cares about coaching, not just driving, is to do that. We, we have got so much work on with four instructors and I could work seven days a week. So I believe the format works. Um, we've had many, many, over six and a half thousand customers, as I said before. So what drives me is the passion to hand the information on. Mm. That's what drives me. And I've got, I, I want to give that information. I want to see people succeed. So when people come through the door, I want them to be the best version of themselves behind the world that they can be. And that's what gives me a kick. So yeah. people, people say, um, you can drive quicker than me around this track. So I can at the moment, but let's see what happens at the end of the training. Yeah. And then we time for consistency. So at Millbrook, most courses each day, there's a session at the end with time consistency laps. Yeah. And then what you see is the lap time tumbles and the time gets more consistent. The bandwidth gets smaller. Yeah. And then you can see, you know, as you coach, because you've done so much of it, you think, okay, we're nearly at that point where you don't need me. Yeah. And sometimes people will say, um, you're holding me back. And I say, I am holding you back, and let's talk about that. Not that I don't trust you driving. It's because you haven't had enough repetition time that we can trust yeah. on it. And then if I don't hold you back and let's say, let's do 10 laps of 50 miles an hour instead of 70, your brain will always take the easy route. So you, something clouds your thought. You're just in that moment where it's starting to get a bit hazardous because you're traveling quickly around the corners. If I just don't suggest that we do 10 laps at a lower speed, if you go straight into that 70 mile an hour speed, if you're challenged by something, you're not quite sure, just in the corner, because you haven't muscle membered it enough, yeah. your brain will just go straight back to the path that it knows, which might see you falling off. Yeah. So then you realize, when you start tracking this with clients, you know in your heart when they're ready. You think, oh, no, we've done enough of this. You've muscle membered it. You're proficient. You're consistent. You can repeat it. Yeah. It's time to move on. It's time to be on your own. And that's all part of the discussion right from the start if mm. that's what the client wants. But you're absolutely right. If you're now working with different clients, you need to then have that flexibility that you are prepared to work with them in the style that they need, in the time they need, and they might want more hand-holding than others. But you're right. If a, if a coach is always wanting to be with you at every race, every test, then I would think there's a hole in their teaching skills because even though that is a very comforting thing to do, um, you need to own it. You need to be yeah. empowered to feel that you can do it. I think ultimately that's where the confidence comes from and you can function on your own in a competitive way. You know from your own, just just doing what you do. Your first podcast, I'm sure, was... <laughs> Shit. Oh, where's this going? <laughs> exactly. And now you're talking to me in your mind. You've got all that history. You've got all that. Yeah. That, that is just the repetition around a lap, isn't it? It's no good. Like that's it. So and you're you're tweaking so, different things, like you're working yeah. on different things, but the level yeah. is so much higher. There you go. And then, so if I said to you, "Here's a bit of empowerment." Hope that doesn't sound condescending. If I said to you, "Treat your racing like your podcast," yeah, 
and just take that ethos into how you want to behave in performing the radical. Because people come that are company owners, directors, self-made people. And then when you start driving, I always say to them, what do you do? What level do you do it at? Not often that blunt. I've got more time than I've got now to talk that through. Yeah. And I'll say, how do you manage a group of people, your engineers? How do you manage a board meeting? They say, well, I've got a process. I always do this. I do this. I want the group involved. They start telling you how they do it. And yeah. so I hold that thought. That's the driving now. Yeah. So what you realize when you do this so often is that actually there's so many parallels in your own life that you can just pull in to what we're doing now behind the wheel. So if I come back to your objective, if I said, if you said to me, if we were discussing, this is your first podcast and you said to me, I want to be on it professional doing the best I possibly can mm. in three podcasts. We probably both say, oh, that's a bit of a stretch. <laughs> yeah. Not sure that's going to happen, is it? <laughs> Maybe a year on when you've done 20, that, that's yeah. going to start happening, isn't it? But even when you've done 100, you're still going to be tweaking it a little. Yeah, your, your point about the process is really interesting because I, with like the podcast, I have a lot of stuff like written down and I've tweaked and I've changed it. And, and, and I do this in all sorts of things. But yeah. often if it's a, a test day or something, I don't have the process as nailed in any way shape or form and it's not that is just purely a like an analyze you know a, a huge part of it would be effectively pre-production yeah or you know yeah. before i'm going to the test day the day before the week before whatever what am i doing and the reality is i'm not getting the the track map out with all my notes on exactly go. how you know each phase of the corner what speed whether it's a lift or a etc yeah watching some footage getting in the space so that when i and then when i get to the track refreshing myself so that it's in my mind lap one yeah. which would probably knock a, a huge chunk off that it would, time it takes it to get acclimatized because you go i know if i've been here before this is what I'm doing. This is how it is. I've thought about it. I've run through it all. Yep. And the performance would be significantly better. And so yeah, Magus Beckett's Chapel, when they're, they're getting five metres on you, what if you sat and visualised every night Yeah. for 30 minutes, 15 minutes, you coming out of that corner on the tail of the car? Yeah. And you've looked at VBOX, you've looked at your download, you've looked at YouTube, you know all the references on that particular section of the circuit. You know your entry and exit speed that are optimised. If you visualise that every night for 10 minutes before you went to sleep, yeah. well, your heart rate might be up, might, you might have to do it before you go to sleep, but you, you would then be formatting a formula for your brain to succeed. You're seeing yeah. success. How often do we do that? We don't see, we don't visualise success, do we? We might see some notes, but can I put that information into a cognitive task that allows me to muscle memory what's going to happen? Yeah, visualizing it in absolute finite detail. Yeah, that's really so, interesting. That's interesting. Yeah, because your job, the job, what you're doing here with me now, you've got a honed process. If I go and do my job. I've got a honed process. You know how to guide me through this, and I know you do because I can sense it. I can feel it. We didn't really discuss before. Right. You, you just gave me an outline, and now your knowledge, your expertise, your subconscious, your conscious, your all your history of how you do this. It's, in your brain and all the paths are open you've guided me very nicely you've made me feel comfortable you've given us a continual conversation you've asked me questions take that to your car yeah take that to your driving so i think a lot of what we do we just expect to do it don't we and the yeah, more you just i've turn done up this, and do it yeah it doesn't <laughs> should happen, be does easy it? <laughs> <laughs> that's it and then the guy that is doing all of this is you know, in the C1, has found two seconds around Snetterton. You think, That's really whether I've true. got time or not to do this, I've got to do this if I'm going to race competitively because the That's... people in the top 10 are all doing it. And actually, it's so distinctive in cars because everyone's, a lot of people's reference point for a lap time is a professional driver. Now, yes. if you break that down, they yep. are a professional driver so if you want to yeah. drive like a professional driver you need to take your driving as serious as a professional would and Correct. i think most people don't i definitely don't no there we go we're getting to the nub of it now if you want to run at the front in clio cup and you've been running in the 182 championship 
and you now want to go into Clio Cup and you think you've got the driving ability to run at the front, I always say, who's going to prepare your car? I was well, I'll prepare my own car. That's fine. Where did you finish in 182? I'll finish in the top 10. Great. Right, you're going to go into Clio Cup and we can almost guarantee that any Clio any team in Clio Cup is going to run that car like they'd run a BTCC car. Yeah. And you'll have professional engineers running the car. It's the same thing, isn't it? We're coming back to yeah. how do I achieve my objective? So people will think, coming back to ego, not in a negative way, just ego, well, I can drive. But there might you don't know what you don't know. So those teams, you're setting your car up and doing a great job and you're doing really well, well done. But maybe as we climb the steps of the grip mountain, yeah. actually... The Clio Cup guys, they're two steps on you in the car prep. You're not going to get to the front. You'll be at the back of the grid. So and then if you just touch... Maybe you could... You, I, I don't know. You're, sorry, I stopped you mid-flow. But Go for it. Go for we're it. looking at, let's say, budget for what you're racing. Exactly. And you might be actually... If you can take... And I was chatting to a friend who wanted to run an SR3 for a bit. And he was looking... He was trying to find a really cheap team. And I run with a company called 360 Racing, who are, who are not cheap. Oh, they're not no, insanely but expensive, good. but they're very good people. And they yeah. know how to run a car. And we were talking about it. And we were breaking down, like, what's the difference in, in cost between running with, let's say, 360 and running with this cheaper team? And what if you've got someone that prepares your car very well, and you can afford it, so maybe you need to run a cheaper car in a different series or whatever, but they take all of that stuff that I'm not doing on a, when I get to the track and my car, I know has been prepped amazingly. It's been like, everything's been looked at. It's been set up. Everything's been done. I can say, Oh, we want to change some setup or, you know, with someone else, the engineer or whatever, we work out stuff to change. It gets done. And I could, if I was taking it very seriously and professionally, I could spend my entire day focusing on driving and I would get the most lap time possible because the car is going to be on point. Correct. If you pay less or you do it yeah. yourself, you don't have the time when you're at the track to just think about driving. You're thinking about all the other things. And you actually might end up with your car not running, mm -hmm. either on pace to be where you want to be, car might not be there, or it might break down, in which case running with a very cheap team might be very expensive. Because your, your time on track is so minimal. Totally agree. And then if you think of the stresses that create perhaps potential distractions, like loading your car up on a trainer, yeah, taking it to track, you might have left two hours earlier than the guy that's just arrived with his helmet and stayed at the hotel overnight. Yeah. You know, all these things. I think it's so, yeah. What somebody said to me years ago, well, when I started racing minutes, somebody said to me, you should be able to write the car off and still be able to get on with your life. Yes. And he said, don't pick a formula where you've invested so much money in it, you can't afford to lose it. Yeah. And, and, and that sits with me as well. You think, yeah, I can, I can throw the kitchen sink at this and I can afford to do it. Whereas yeah. if I go up three formulas, perhaps I'm going to run on a budget and it won't be as good, it won't be as um, efficient, it won't be as proficient, it won't be where I want it to be. And if I write it off, I've now perhaps written off way more than I can afford. So Yeah, it's affecting your life. Outside exactly. of racing. Yeah, and I know a lot of people might do, you know, younger people might do that to get where they want to be professionally. And we hear all the stories, of, like Nicky Lauder, wasn't it? He went to the bank and got a bank loan to buy his Brabham, you know, yeah. all these to get a year with Brabham. So all those things go on, I know. But if it's a hobby and a sport and an interest, you want to enjoy it, don't you? So um, it comes down to why uh, you're yeah. doing it. Hey. It does. And then I also think when you, when you run teams, as I've done and I've been involved in it, just an articulated lorry, how much is that a pound? You know, how many, that's three pound a mile, let's say. Yeah. So when you look at the costs of what you're, now if, if you go to the track and they've got a driver's room in, in the truck and you can play your V, you can play your, you know, look at your V box in the truck yeah. in comfort and they supply you with some food and some drink and some refreshments and the truck is clean and tidy and reliable. All those, all those back end based costs have got to be handed on to the person that's, yeah paying for their services aren't they so you know we've done it where we've went you know you go to the race of remembrance and you're going to be there for three or four days so joe comes with me she runs a business with me she starts it with me she runs us as manages us and does fuel burn counts and things she's involved in it 
but as we go, and my son's now with us, and we've got the grandchildren, they don't want to be in a gazebo in the freezing yeah. cold at Anglesey with it pouring rain. And I yeah. just think the other thing that I've learned over the years, you put wet, you, if your race overalls get wet, most race cars, different than an open top, most race cars are enclosed, don't have a heater. So yeah. your overalls get wet, you get in the car and you're in the collection area and all the windows have already steamed up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you're now starting to perspire and you're thinking, well, I'm getting in contact with adrenaline and you think, crap, I can't see out. Yeah. So you don't want to get wet and cold. You want to get right. in that car bone dry. So all those little detail points, you think, if we're in a Winnebago that is a cost or a, or a transit camper van, which is a much smaller cost, but you've got a base. Yeah. So I actually, not everybody maybe have that view and, and, you know, they might be on a shoestring going racing. I'm all for that. I did exactly the same myself. But I think we can sometimes ignore what seems to be a degree of luxury or an unnecessary expense. But that, if you want to get on and do well and be at the pinnacle of your game, I think it might be a lesser percentage of the success, but I still think it qualifies as for consideration. Yeah. Because, you know, you don't want to be in a wet gazebo freezing cold and then jumping in the car for half an hour soaking wet. And then your windows steam up and you can't see out. And you've got a cloth between your legs. And you're trying to write the window with your race harnesses on. All those things, it just yeah. it takes away the professionalism, perhaps your ability to do well. So, I've, yeah, we can't. And then your what mental state are you in? So if you've got to drive, and, and this happens to me on track days all the time, like I've got to drive an hour and a half to get there. I would really rather not do that. But yeah. if I'm racing, if I can help it, I will definitely stay somewhere the night before. And yeah. so I'm there and you just got to get up, have some breakfast, go to the track. Yeah. Job done. Um, but the the thing I've noticed in, and this is an interesting sort of like psychological point, is I had a big crash in the Spa C1 24 hours the second time we did it. And it was at like four in the morning and my i made a bad decision not it basically at what is it um i can't remember what the, the corner is called the the fastest it's about two before the end fast left that then goes into yeah. the sort of Blanchiment. whatever it bust up yeah blush yeah and it was wet and i was i had not a lot of sleep because you just don't have that much time to sleep. Yeah. And, and actually yeah. getting out of a race car, buzzing, and then going yeah. to sleep is quite challenging. It's hard, isn't it? Yeah, it's hard. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I'd done that corner and I'd, I'd tried to do it flat. And in the dry, it's flat, like no problem. But in the wet, it's not flat. And it's like, yeah, it's like, yeah, maybe, maybe. And I'd had a couple <laughs> of like, a couple of like big slides and been fine. And then I just kept trying to do it, I was like, but maybe this time it's flat. Maybe it's near, you know, I just kept trying to push it. Yeah. And it, and you're, it's an endurance race. You're doing a three hour stint or two hours 45 or something. And it's about average lap time and it's wet. So loads of people are not driving, you know. Yes, yeah. The average lap time to win is actually pretty slow if you have no incidents. Yeah. It's it's really quite slow. It is um, C1. Yeah, yeah, it's the same. You and need I just to stay kept, out the bits and get the Yeah, so this, this is in the C1. And... And I just kept pushing it and I kept pushing it until I came unstuck. And I just, I put on a bit of too much lock to correct and then got a little snap, 100 miles an hour into the tires. Oh, did you hurt yourself? I, I was okay. Um, yeah. Psychologically, I was not okay. Okay. Yeah. So like it took me a while one of the things that I find is actually really important in any crash I've had, if possible, is I want a camera running that is secure that I can see the footage afterwards. Because I've had a couple of crashes that have been sketchy, or whatever, for various reasons. And a huge part of that process for me is knowing why I crashed. Okay. I need to know why I crashed. Yeah, if I can I, understand that. Because... If in my head it's a mechanical issue, for example, I had a, 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 a pretty shunty one at a Brands in my SR1 and corner, corner one I, on the brakes, lost the rear and went onto the in, into the inside wall at like you know, okay. 70 or something backwards. Um, and I didn't know why that happened I, it, for ages, okay. but we had the footage. And then one of my friends, he's, does, has done a lot more racing than me. He looked at the footage and he was like, it's brake, brake bias. 
it's just brake buyers. And that car, we'd always, always, always struggled with getting it to lock the fronts remotely before the rears. It was always pretty sketchy. Uh, okay. um, and yeah. the SR1s at that time were really bad for it, like really bad yeah. for it. And because it's a spec car, you can't really, you didn't have a lot in your toolbox yeah. to, to, to adjust it. Um, and then the SR3 was much better. Um, yeah, and, it's okay. and, and the car always felt sketchy to drive. So I yeah. never had total confidence in it. I was driving it all over the shop. It's like ripping the handbrake into the corner, backing it in yeah. and whatnot. Yeah. But like yeah. not that quick and not you couldn't you couldn't push it too far because you always knew that if I press this pedal too much, it's gonna try and swap ends on me. And yeah, okay. And that for a long time, I don't know, six months or five months or four months until someone said that was brake bias. Brake bias. I just thought that car was sketchy as hell and was like, yeah, it, okay. it could just spit me off. So in the, um, when I crashed the C1 at Blanchemont, the the camera we had was just like loosely mounted to the windscreen uh, or something. It yeah. flew around, smashed itself yeah. to pieces, yeah. lost the SD card, whatever. And so I never knew why. And I can, I can give you a hint there because <laughs> what you've, Shall I jump in there? Go for it. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah. What? What? This is. We're back to psychology again. Yeah. Okay. So I can give what you've said to me is I hear on a regular basis, and I witness it happening sometimes two or three times a week. So what I find interesting is we'll be working on the handling circuit, and yeah. we'll be with the client, and we're going starting to build pace. We, if we get going quickly, we put helmets on, and it gets a bit more serious. But the core skills is always about. It technique and repeatability before the yeah. speed so we get going and then i don't know i still haven't quite worked out why but it's what don't be too hard on yourself for what you've just told me you've done because that's the human response so if you ask somebody who's whatever the track if they've gone if they've done a proficient lap and these these are my standard questions this gets me into the discussion and i'll say what corners are you happy with and they'll let's say we've got 10 corners. Yeah. They'll say I'm at grip limit on one, two, and three, but I think I can go quicker on four, five, six, and seven, and eight, and nine, and ten. I'll say, okay, fine. What's your plan? Yeah. And then they'll say, it doesn't surprise me anymore, but it always did. They'll say, well, I'm going to push a bit harder on corners one, two, and three. Yeah. That's what people, that is people's response. And I'll say, okay, tell me why you're going to do that. Yeah. And, I, and then they'll say, well, I think I can go a bit quicker. Yeah. And then we start downloading. Okay, give me a download. Freeze frame, corner one, two, and three apex, and tell me what the car's doing. Oh, it's just starting to slide. It's just starting yeah. to understeer. I can hear the tires chirping. And I'll say, there's some clues there that you can't go any quicker. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, I hadn't thought of it like that. Okay, so what should we do? Okay, let's let's start working on corner four, five, and six. Yeah. So what you've just said to me is how humans behave. Yeah. I can't answer the reason why. That might be a psychologist needs to answer that. But what always surprised me and doesn't anymore is that once people find grip limit, they want to continue pushing beyond grip limit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what we also teach is comes back to the engineering. It's actually listening, living, feeling the car. Mm. So that part of the engineering content is – so, for example, what you just said on the trail break, if I get a little bit more technical – most performance cars, you buy a McLaren, a Ferrari, a race car, the front caliper is at the back of the front wheel. Yeah. So think of polar moments of inertia. If I put the caliper at the front wheel, it would be like a push bike. If I put a spoke, a stick in a spoke, you'd rotate round. Yeah. It would try and throw you off the handlebars. If I put the caliper at the rear of the front wheel, it pulls the car into the ground. If I now put the rear caliper at the front of the rear wheel, the car remains flat as you brake. Right. Making sense? Yeah, yeah. So the caliper position is pulling you into the ground. We all think when we trail brake, and you trail brake a radical, that the car's doing this. Actually, if you look at any current performance car, GT car, hypercar, race car like a radical, when you brake, generally the seal line stays parallel with the road. Okay. What you also have on, yeah, what you also have on sports cars, on the front you have anti-dive, the clever arrangement of the wishbones and the suspension resists the compression of the spring at the front, longitudinally, not in a corner. So when you brake, not all of that spring is compressed and it's resisted. Same on the rear, it's called squat. So when you brake a modern sports car or a radical, the car gets pulled flat into the ground. If I brake in my Austin at speed, I get literally thrown forward. It was made in 1958. This hadn't yeah. been worked out then. 
any current car, when you trail brake, now think of the logic. When you straight line brake, you lift the nose, you'll create some push. When you trail brake, you pull the car in flat and it rotates efficiently. Yeah. So what you would perhaps consider in your radical would be then the percentage of trail. If I trail brake, as an engineer, we would speak of percentage of trail. Am I finishing 5% of my braking into the corner? 10%, 15%, 20%. Yeah. So the further back the engine goes in the car, the more we generally need to trail to keep the car hunkered down on the road so we don't get the understeer. Yeah. So as you've just discussed, you've got rear brake bias. So my initial, if we were together, I would be very interested in your trail braking technique. Because if you were a straight line breaker, I'm not advocating doing that in the radical, but if you were, because you hadn't learned to trail brake, you'd actually get on the gas, you'd lift the nose up, and then you wouldn't have any of that problem. The car would understeer through, and you'd been complaining about the understeer. But this, clearly you're a trail breaker. This was like brake, in a straight line. This, this car okay. would, in a straight line, if you like, and I learned actually with that car, if you, this con, you know, everyone's like, you've got error, whatever, you can slam the brakes. And they're like... If you slammed in brakes in an SR1, just literally like, okay, for the people that are listening, I'm saying my foot's like somewhere near away from the brake pedal and you just hit it as hard as you can. Yeah. There's no, there's no in the middle. The back of the car would lift up. It would skip. And then you would right. like chirp the rear. And, and I was like, oh, okay. Then I learned that you like with the steering, you give it a little hint, just a tiny little, little bit, preload it. Yeah. And then you can hit it really hard. And the, and the back did not come off the ground. In my okay. SR1, if you gave it full beans with a, even with a, with a little hint it would lock the rears okay so the, it was it was a proper like mechanical problem in the SR3 does not do it does like but i totally yeah, understand okay. your point about adjusting your trail braking to then change yes. the the weight in terms of and then you can make the rear light if you want to by holding more if weight on the front to. yeah um, or get it off so maybe that spin is a is a discussion on vehicle dynamics first. Yeah. To explore the concept of why car, if you trail brake, you reduce understeer and negate it, and you optimize lateral acceleration, the turning acceleration on the turning phase of the corner. So I used to look after cars where you'd have a dual two drivers. One would get out and say understeer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One yeah. would get out and say oversteer. And you think, well, I can't adjust it, and I don't yeah. know how to for you both. And I'd say that I don't know what to do. It's quite I interesting. Come up with that a compromise. Because I. But then you. Yeah, so now, are you, sorry, sorry to keep going, but then you think, oh, one of you was straight line braking, lifting the nose up, one of you was trail braking, yeah. getting the back to rotate. So those two driving soles, when you come back to your brakes locking, that's like a red flag, isn't it? Yeah. I've got to be so careful with the trail braking because I know that if I just go in a bit too much on that yeah. brake pedal, that back's going to swap ends on me. So, yeah, now a lot of people wouldn't, if they didn't understand the engineering, they haven't got your knowledge. They would just spin off on the first corner. Yeah because they might not have evolved into incremental increase feeling the car. Yeah. So quite it's, often people are coming to us, I've crashed, right, well, explain why, and then through the training they start to go, oh, I've got it now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. I won't do that again. Yeah. yeah. The yeah. I always found it hilarious that with relatively little track knowledge, I'd come in and then the engineer or whatever, the person setting up the car would be like, what setup changes do you want to go? Or, you know, what do you think the car's doing? And I was it's like, guys, let's just pause because I do not have enough, <laughs> I do not have enough experience, knowledge and lap times in a car to tell you if the car needs to understeer less or change stuff because I don't know whether I'm driving it correctly. If I'm driving it yeah. correctly, maybe it will drive amazingly. So I don't want you to change yeah. anything until I've worked out that what I'm doing. What if I'm messing it up? <laughs> yeah. If I'm doing I'm all of the I'll stuff correctly, yeah. then let's look at the car because who yeah. knows? Yeah, I get that. I get that. I, I'm not just picking you up on it, but I would change the wording a little. Okay. Because, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because what you also realise when I come back to my discussion on evaluation and test, there is no right or wrong. Yeah. So how I describe it to clients is there's a straight line of knowledge. Yeah. And then whatever you're in, that straight line, that's how the car wants to be driven and you'll go as quick as you can. Okay, yeah. But there's always a bandwidth either side for the driver's technique. Mm. And the skill of the engineer is then to bring that back into line in yeah. parallel with the driver's technique. But you're, you're absolutely right. In something like a radical, you need a degree, I think, of an understanding of some dynamics and 
uh, the the correct download on what you're doing, knowing yeah. what you're doing, and not driving on instinct or subconsciously, which we all do to a degree and rely on. But there needs to be a process there, doesn't there, to actually optimize that type of car? Yeah. Um, but I think I, we all. I've, I move away from am I driving this right? And then ask more more open questions. Yeah. How are you driving it? Yeah. What is the characteristic of the car on the low speed, medium speed, high speed corners? What does the roll rate feel like on those? Can we split it into some more in-depth mm. thoughts on what you're feeling? Then you start to get the right answers back. Yeah. We always say in coaching, if you ask the right question, you'll get the right answer. But then engineers aren't coaches, they're engineers. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They want to know like so, what we're tweaking. Yeah. Yeah, they're assuming objective. you've got the perfect driver. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or, Who knows what they're talking uh, about? <laughs> yeah, or can they make the car perfect for the imperfect driver? Isn't it? Oh, that, yes, that, yes. You know, How can they optimise? Uh, yes, yeah. And then, and I learned that in Nissan because I've always got used to working with small teams. And then if you wanted to do something because you had a gut instinct and your experience was telling you you were correct like change a damper or, or some yeah. kind of significant part of the car, you could do that because yeah. you make the decisions or the people around you are making the decisions with you. When you go to a manufacturer, Nissan has a test and evaluation drive, I would say something wasn't quite right or to design intent or to the spec. Yeah. And the next question coming back at me is prove it. <laughs> Give me objective data. Yeah. And then that was my hardest transfer of, of how to behave within those within Nissan because – well, it's right because I that's what I'm feeling. I was well, you can't spend another two million on because God says yeah, 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 he's yeah. feeling something. You've got to get in there and prove it objectively. So, if you work with professional race teams, it's objectivity. The driver's the king pin, isn't it? It's who's relaying back that information and looking to drive quick. But engineers are very objective, they want facts and figures. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. And there's ways to do that as a driver to give them the right feedback and you can separate the corner into certain sections that gives them what they need. But yeah, it's, it's, a, very, it's a great... I think another thing, it, one is like this it, this reps thing as well. And I need, I know with my stuff, I need more of an understanding of, let's say, the entirety of setup and differences that they make. So um, one day we were like, one afternoon done some laps or whatever and i was like actually there's a, do you want to run the car a bit stiffer or a bit softer and you know what's perfect and i was like well ultimately with these cars what's you know what's yeah. fast and i want to be able to sort of drive that and then maybe massage it a little bit and they're like well generally if you set it up stiffer and you can drive it it's a bit more edgy but it's a bit faster um or you know, if you're a competent level that's logical a competent level driver or, you know, at a certain level. So I said, right, okay, look, there's not much difference in fully fully soft and fully hard in terms of actual rates on these cars. Uh, let's run it fully hard and let's run it fully soft. And I'm going to do five laps on each and then come back. And, then, and that was a really interesting process. Uh, and I would love to do yeah. that with, spend a bit more time running on that car, for example, different anti-roll bars, whatever. Just run through yes. all the set of options, maybe different tyre pressures. Let's run some wonky tyre pressures, all these sorts of yes. things and start to build up my knowledge map of the situations Yes, and then go, actually, I think I would like it a bit That's stiffer a here. Um, because up until that point, you, you don't know. You don't have the reference points. No. There's a, there's a few areas of discussion there. One is you need to be consistent to feel the change. True. So you need, um, on, a, on a longer circuit like Sneddon, you'd want the driver to be within three tenths of a second consistency <laughs> so that they can evaluate the change. So when you work yeah. with engineers in the motor industry, what they're very, we, we speak of consistency, repeatability, and the phrase is robotic isolation. You have okay, to be able yeah. to drive absolutely robotically so that if you change the spring rate, you know it's the spring rate that's changed the dynamic not of the car, input. not the driver's technique. Yeah. So what you realise is when you start working with engineers and, and they're good at what they do, they're like robots, and that's what we teach. We, we yeah. need to be robotic. So I think we can discuss the consistency side is is, is very important. Uh, we do in our training, going to sound like a cell again, but here we go. Um, we've got a Clio Cup RS, and it used to be a Subaru, it's now a Clio Cup, 
It's got AST dampers on it. And on day two, on the track and the race schedule, Academy, we evaluate three different settings over seven criteria. Mm. So you drive the right setting, fully hard and fully soft. We drive the same route, exactly the same route on three settings, and then you evaluate it on a score sheet. Mm. Because then what you would also realise if you get into that is that those areas that we're evaluating are the areas that you should be considering to understand how a car behaves at grip limit. So you would simply say your response, the steering. If you stiffen the car up, you generally get a sharper your response. Yeah. So then we could add on another layer to that. We could say, if we we're evaluating, we could say, and you could do the same in your article. It's, it's not for just for engineers. It's what we teach racers to do. Does the steering turn what I expect? Does it turn less? Does it turn more? Is it exponential? Does it turn a little bit than a lot? Is there your delay? I turn it, not a lot okay. happens, and then it goes. Yeah. So what you realize when you start getting into this, you're back to this conversation earlier, you're just layering up. Yeah. So you've got the driving. Now I can change the dampers. <laughs> yeah, I've got the hang of that. Right, now if I make two clicks on the front, let's evaluate the change. Let's start looking at these criteria. That's where the more new time comes from. But what also comes from the training is that you're dialing into the dynamic of the car. You're living with the car. Yeah, you're yeah. understanding it. So what I'm really interested in what you said, as soon as you said what you were about to do, my instant thought was, what is the window you have of recovery? So a really nice way to think about this that I believe is work. You go stiffer, you're making, people say the car is more edgy and you've got to be able to drive it. Well, what does that mean in context? More edgy. What does that mean? It means it's a bit edgy, it's but I don't movement. fall off. <laughs> yes. Or it is edgy and I just get kicked yeah. off the track with it. If, but what we really, it normally boils down to, if you look at the psychology of how humans behave, humans sense tire grip through roll rate of the body. That's one of the key factors. So if you've got someone in a soft road clear, they'll sense tire grip very easily because yeah. the car moves around. Yeah. And proportionally as the speed builds, you get more rolls. So that's what your brain's picking up mm. to sense tire grip, whether you realize it or not, that's what's happening. Then if you start changing the dynamic of the car and you make a car very stiff, what you now lose is the window for your brain to absorb the roll rate. Yeah. So you drive it. I owned a March up until recently, a Sports 2000. You drive that on track. I did a lot of work now. I just recently sold it, but I, I did a half dozen track days in it just to enjoy myself. And what you realize is when you drive all the cars that I'm used to driving, yeah. uh, Ferraris, Porsches, all those things that you're not driving, to coaching in, or the cars I've experienced myself, you get a time to think about this. You get quite you'll a lot. You'll be the same in your, yeah, in a march, like you're radical, you think, well, I've just gone into that corner. What happened? Um, that little window that I've normally, that big window that I've got to work out what's happening is tiny. Yeah. So then you have to f minutely start piecing and freeze framing that moment so that you can think, oh, I want a bit more understeer. I want a bit less oversteer. I want a bit more, yeah, yeah. Uh, less understeer. So, I think I always think of windows. What time have I got then to actually start thinking about what's going on? And I think, again, in a radical, the window's quite small. Yeah. But the stiffer you make a car, then that smaller. window for you to recover, it gets smaller. Yeah. And that isn't, I think, something that we often think of. If you contextualize it, the, driver's, the, the engineer says it's going to be a bit more edgy. So am I going front forwards, front into the tyres? Or am I going backwards into the tyres? You know, that's <laughs> what it really means, isn't it? Or what what end of, is going in the gravel track first? Yeah. I think we should think about windows, time to examine, time to evaluate, yeah. time to feel and understand, and also what windows the car giving me to recover this. And yeah. what I've also learned that, that I think is really um, relevant to the conversation what isn't often realised until you start getting more into the depths of this, if you make an adjustment at one end of the car, without adjusting anything, you make the opposing adjustment on the other end. So if you yeah. make the front stiffer, by default, without adjusting anything, you make the back softer. Yeah. So that's a very interesting thing when you start working with drivers or engine, you're talking to engineers, because what we're also interested in is the the adjustment you've made, but also the reflection of that in the, on the other end of the car. Yeah. You might not have changed anything on the setup sheet, but you'll get a change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then also, I think it's worth talking about where you are you on the bell curve, because all the books will tell us uh, the front's understeer and make the front softer and the back stiffer. That's the logic. Yeah, but then or just you work, could just, yeah. yeah, you could just be on the curve where the opposite's going to happen.
Because yeah, yeah, you've, yeah. you've taken all that logical adjustment and it's going to go the other way. You've, you've so got that you, um, amount of steering lock on and you're like, I want more. And you've added more, which doesn't... Yes. <laughs> you're understeering and you're trying to add more. Yes. Yeah. So exactly that. So when you start thinking of the setup of the car versus the driver, it's always a coming together of the technique and the car. Yeah. But we teach, what I'm now saying, we teach that. Yeah. Because you want the driver to sit in the car. Well, if I do that to that end, that's going to happen at that end. Yeah. And I'm not happy what's happening at the back end at the moment. Can we find another way? You know, can I adjust the pyro? What's happening with the rear pressures opposed to the front? So it's a huge subject, isn't it? But I think there is okay, a that logical topic, way in. That topic. And I, I, I realise we've, 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 we've done a solid like two hours, 15 <laughs> or something already. So I'm good. Don't worry. We, I'm good. we might have to sort of trim the general outline a little bit, but let's talk about a little bit about, well, we, I think we have, and people have picked up of, of what you guys do, but teaching that, how do you, how do you go about teaching that because I I've, I find I think for me that would be very useful to dive deeper it's, into those elements and the way you break it down and how do you go about that? Engineering and logic, sort of yeah, engineering logic. So one example would be what I've just mentioned in the clear because that yeah. gives you a real time opportunity to evaluate the change. What you then need to understand is um, some simple engineering. Uh, so we start getting involved in what we would term as a slip angle map. Um, yeah. let's think about the logic of, of the, there's lots of variations. So you've got the variable of the driver and then the driver will have an influence on how the car behaves. It might behave in a certain way as it's designed to, i.e. a GT3 RS when it comes out the factory will always understeer on its standard yeah. Porsche Geo set. If you're proficient at track days, you go straight to your, your, your Porsche dealer and, or your specialist and say, can you make it a more track focused Geo? I want a bit of neutral or maybe a hint of oversteer. Yeah. So the driver that understands that, how they drive and have as an intimate relationship with their technique would understand what they need. Whereas somebody that hasn't got that knowledge and needs to start to understand it, what we would look at is the, the platform of the car and what it actually does at steady state. So let me give you some clear examples. If you were a racing driver, you want to make the corner as short as possible. So when you, when you trail brake, you optimize lateral acceleration in the shortest distance. So you rotate the car efficiently in the shortest distance. So that conventional 90 degree line that links all the points as a radius disappears because yeah. then you've got a sharper turn in. So this, the exit is straighter. So a trail brake will shorten the corner. If you're an engineer and you're evaluating cars, you do the opposite. You want that middle section of the corner to be as long as possible because you want to evaluate a characteristic potential okay, yeah. or validate a characteristic. So cornering lines for engineers and racers is a little different. Okay. The racer might end up on that. The, the engineer might end up on that line at some point, testing the car at highest possible speed, a sports car. But So if we now start delving into the engineering world, what we, how we teach engineers is how we would teach you. We would give you an appreciation that this might not come across without a sketch, but cars generate grip through slip angle. When you turn the steering, the wheel will turn the amount you steered, and the tyre always turns slightly less on the rim. Yeah, That's called slip angle, and that's how tyres generate friction and grip. If I break a corner into four as a starting point, I've got a braking zone, a turning zone, a middle of the corner, which is referred to as steady state, because you'd be steady state, steady gas, steady steer, and an exit zone. Now, if I now relate, if I'm losing you, tell me, or if you think this is not coming across because it's, it's verbal no. rather than a no, sketch. No, no, give it to me. <laughs> okay, so you turn the car into the turn. Let's ignore the braking zone for the moment. Yeah. Let's say we're straight line braking. We're not a trail brake. We're straight line brake. We settle the car on the gas. We turn in. It's only the front wheels that steer. Even if you've got rear wheel steer, it's going to be small amounts. And generally, that helps us in lower speed corners. So as you turn in, the front tyres generate slip angle before the rear because the rear wheels don't steer. Would you agree yeah. with that statement? Yeah, yeah. So as, yeah, as you turn in, the only way the rear tyres get slip angle is because you eventually roll in and the tyres flex on the rim. So whether you can feel it or not, there has to be some understeer because you're generating slip angle front to rear on the move. Yeah. So as a racer or an engineer, we could evaluate the turning characteristic of the car. If we're a straight line breaker, a, a production vehicle would be set to understeer for the highway it's safer. Now, once you're in the corner, you've now got equal, pseudo equal, because you're always going to be on the front and the rear. You'd have an equilibrium of front slip angle where it should be, rear where it should be. You can now evaluate yeah. 
like, the characteristic of the car at grip limit. Four degrees, four degrees, or whatever. That's it. Yep. Okay. So now the car will tell you what it does at grip limit. It can't tell you that on the way in because it's developing slip angle on yeah. the way in, front to rear. So now I've got an evaluation criteria. I can evaluate the turning. I can evaluate the steady state. Once I leave the corner, I've got the opposite happening. I'm unwinding the steering, but it will take me some distance out of the corner before I've released all, released all the slip angle on the rear. Yep. In a rear-wheel drive car, we would refer to that to the oversteer phase because especially what we all do on track days, if we're new, we all tend to leave the steering on a bit much. We don't want to go out there by that dangerous curve. I need yeah, to leave yeah, myself yeah. a safety margin. So what you're now doing is it's more, you're more risk of spinning, aren't you? Because yeah. you're tightening... So you're increasing the rear slip angle while you're putting the power on. Yeah. You're in a danger zone. Hence, we teach this on all our courses so that you start to get the measure of where you're at risk. So now I've got a predictor as to how that car will behave in a corner. Understeer, steady state characteristic, potentially oversteer. So now I could go back to start evaluating how cars behave and the different damper settings. Mm. And then I would then, as, as a driver... I can now start to have a formulaic plan for a corner. Low speed, medium speed, high speed, I'd evaluate the characteristic on turning, steady state, and exit. Yeah. So when you drive your radical, that's what I would be encouraging you to do. I can now start layering up. Yeah. Because I can now just start increasing the knowledge for you to explore in those three criteria. What we could also look at then is the braking phase. Because to technically evaluate the car correctly as an engineer, there has to be, there cannot be control over that. So I would brake, off brake, on gas, steer, with the correct amount of gas applied for the scrub of the tyre I've generated. We could also add that the gas is a levelling device. Each time I turn the steering wheel, I create friction. That friction slows me down. So here goes, on any corner, on any day, on any tyre, on any surface, I need to apply the correct amount of gas to compensate for the scrub of the tyre that's slowing me down to find equilibrium. Okay. So now we can get super super involved in what you're doing with the gas pedal. At what phase? Yeah. How much? How little? How it's applied? How you come off the pedal to settle the car? Often drivers are a little slow. If we trail brake, what a complex thing because you're going to threshold brake and reduce the pressure as the car slows, so now you've got, let's say, the first 75% is relative to the threshold brake, then as you trail brake your radical, you're going to now start rotating the steering, the vector, and manage the vector of the sideways and forwards with the release of the pedal at the appropriate rate to create the radius and the scrub that you want on the tyres and the brake. Then once you've come off the brake and you've finished the braking, you need to get quickly onto the gas to settle the car to keep it level. Otherwise, the car's going to roll in. And the spring of the damper will take yeah, yeah. time to uh, dampen out the inconsistency or the dynamic um, change the driver's created with perhaps a slow foot from brake to gas. So even going on from brake to gas, we always teach. It's quite a complex thing because you're using your muscles and your tendons to slow your foot down to the appropriate rate. I don't yeah. want to go on and come off. So now if you start thinking about how we train you to evaluate a car, these are the routes in. Mm. because you need to be robotic you need to understand the three phases and why you need to be able to then understand what the characteristics are i'm evaluating we do that through exercises some of them quite complex but yeah. also simple so now you build up this picture in your mind of what the car is doing how it's dynamically working and then you once you've repeated that and you can be consistent you can then have some kind of formulaic plan on what the car is doing mm. so when you come back to me and say and i mean it in a very nice way it's not meant to be condescending you say well, yeah, get to the track and be radical and I'm ready to go. Yeah, yeah. You think, well, actually, if we'd have prepared and you'd have done your visualisation, you know where I'm going with this. You've had maybe a day's training on what to expect from the car in what phase of the corner. Yeah. Corner. The slip angle map is a predictor of what the car's going to do. You can relate it to driving. Uh, I I would never mention names. It would be unprofessional and unfair, but we did have a, a customer who came in a Mustang, bought it for their birthday present and spun it on a roundabout. And then they were very uncomfortable with driving it. Yeah, I can so imagine. We, work, we worked on slip angle maps, and the customer, my client said, well, okay then. So if I straighten my steering wheel and count to three and then put the power down out of the corner or the roundabout, I'm going to be safer. Absolutely. Because learning what yeah. cars do gives you the – empowers you. Right, I can mm. come up with a plan to sort this. Yeah. Take that into racing, 
Okay, so I know I'm heating, I'm teasing. I know I've got good rotation. I know I've trail brake to a good percentage. I've got optimum grip from the G on the tyre on my telemetry. It says I've got to pull 1.3 G and I'm doing that from brake to turn in and into. I can rely, I think, on my steering trace, my throttle trace, my brake trace and the objective data from the G to tell me that I'm doing a good job there. But actually, I'm getting a hint of understeer that I don't want. Yeah. Engineers. Can we get rid of the understeer on zone two of the corner? What does that what does that understeer mean through the corner? It means that I've got traction and grip, but I can't use it because I can't really get on the power until the wheel's straight on the exit phase of the corner in yeah. zone four. Now, look at the conversation you're having with an engineer based on just understanding the slip angle map. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you can now start feeding back, okay, I've got four phases, brake, turn in, steady state, exit. I can now start to prescriptively feed back. Well, it's really good on low and medium speed corners, but high speed corners, I've still got too much understeer. Yeah. But it's only in zone two, which means I've now got it for the duration of the corner. When I try and get rid of it, I get oversteer. Yeah. All the things that I know you know, because you've touched on that. Yeah, it's All really I've interesting. All I've said is, look, make it a plan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. with some very simple engineering and some understanding of how cars behave and how tires generate, maintain, and lose grip, you're now into a formulaic plan. We can, I know we make inroads with drivers very quickly, and you'll read that on all our trust pilots, mm. which I'm hugely proud of. You look at our trust pilots, we've got 860 now, and all of ours except two, which are four. And if you start digging, you'll see this is what people yeah. are saying. So what we've done, if you're happy for me to keep talking, yeah, 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 what yeah. I didn't realise, when I started CAT, I thought everybody teaches like this. They're all engineers, they're all no, teaching this. They don't. <laughs> no, and then when I got into it, I was about five or six years in, and I thought, oh, we've got something really different here. Yeah. And that's what I've really just pushed through. All, my, all the guys that work with me, we've got a great close team, three instructors. Uh, it will take you three years as an instructor coming to me, highly experienced, to, to be able to deliver the engineering courses mm. at the level we deliver them to engineers. So even when you come with a very, very good skill set, the engineering side is another big add-on. It's a bolt onto the side yeah. of everything you know, but it's what makes cat cat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, Paul and I, Paul's, Paul and I have been working together for 12 years. Steve's now coming into his fourth year. I'm just working with a new instructor that I worked with many years ago when I started who left instructing has come back to it. So he's now working for us part-time, a really, really good instructor who's now into cars, track days, and absorbing all this again. So, yeah. Yeah. It's such a good way of looking at it because I've I've seen, you know, you come across sort of, I'd say, different sorts of styles. And then I think a lot of it, and I'll give a lot of the people I've come across in the past, and, and I've had lots that are very good, lots that I've picked up bits of information, but it's, I've not necessarily spent very long with the person. So they haven't had much time to learn me and I haven't had sure. much time to learn them. And I've had it sometimes where someone will say something to me and my engineering brain, I studied mechanical engineering, goes, ah, goes, right. oh, you slipped that in at the end. Yeah, I thought, yeah, okay. you know, let that in. Um, <laughs> but goes like, no. And I sometimes, my brain just goes, no. Like the way they're saying, whatever they're saying, and I just go, yeah. I think you're trying to explain an engineering concept or some physics or something without mentioning the physics and the engineering. And you're just saying a statement at me. And my brain's going, Immediately, my mindset is, and it's it's to my detriment sometimes, goes, is there a situation I can think of where that's wrong? <laughs> like, uh, and I do that a lot. Well, well, that's the that's the scientific engineering and view. I don't, I'm not just being kind to you. We face that generally every day with engineers. Yes. Because I think if you are, if you are a physicist, a scientist, an engineer, you're always looking to qualify what you know and what you're doing yeah. is right, isn't it? And I'm, I don't see anything wrong in that at all. And then we encourage that. So we've had people say, no, you're wrong. I say, well. And I don't say you're why. wrong. I just, no. I just, if someone said something, uh, what was it? It was something about, I can't remember what it was. It, it, it was something about the front of the car, the rear of the car and what was happening and blah, blah, blah. And they were like, no, it's the other end or something. And I was like, what are you talking about? This just doesn't like, and it was that point that you brought on earlier when you say something and that the person you're talking to, and I was the person being talked to, face goes, mm, mm, blank. Yeah. I think we need to. And then that's when you would go, okay, we're going to look at this a different way. We're going to discuss this a different yeah. way. Well, the way yeah. I'm telling you is not clicking with you. 
And it was no. the one I'm thinking of. It was really not clicking to the point where I was starting to go like, but you've not explained this and you keep bashing it. And I fundamentally think what you're saying is wrong. Not, not just yeah. like, I don't understand it. I think it's yeah, wrong. Yeah, no, convince me otherwise. You need, yeah. to, you need to change tact and we need to go down a different avenue. And a lot of that is then, is having the mindset that, you know, you need to go, that's a thing. But also you need time with someone to you understand. You absolutely do. And if you've got 20 and minutes or two hours. And, yep. And it's not enough. And then people will say to us, yeah, they've done a track day and the instructor didn't teach me this. And we're always calm. We say, look, yeah. they've got 20 minutes with and you. What they've can they do? An hour. They, they can show you the lines, where to break. That's it. Yeah. And they might just get a, a, a bit of advice in on your technique if it's dangerous and they want to help you. Yeah. But that's it. So, no, we I'm fully aware of that. You need to... You need to invest in yourself and be prepared to commit, obviously, a, a, a sum of money, but also the time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you're, I think, yeah. Yeah, your point about, uh, it was funny because it resonated and it's something that I feel like it's, it's said to a lot of people is you need to, un, un, you know, you need to take off the steering. And pretty much universally, whenever someone said that to me, my head has gone, I could not have taken that off in the current situation, all inputs the same earlier. Yeah. I, I, and it could be, maybe what actually needed to be happening is I needed to be on the power a little bit more and then the back would have started to neutralize a little bit and then, then, yeah. then you can take it off and the car's still rotating yeah. and you can go off down the road, fine. But if yeah. I just undo the steering, I'm going off the track. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so then what we could also, what always um, accompanies that request is to contextualise it. Yes. Because that could be two degrees over two metres. Yes. So someone's very big and someone's very small. So what you realise when you do this job, it has to always be contextualised. Yeah. It's a word I use all the time. And if you ask somebody what they're doing and how they're doing it, they'll tell you. And if the download I'm seeing is the same, fine. And then we can contextualize. But quite often you ask the question, you think, ah, that's, we speak of perception and reality. Yeah. So what is your perception of, of the reality? Actually, your perception isn't your reality. No. You're doing something slightly different to what you think you're doing. Yeah. Um, you can get a situation where, and, and I'm sh you, the listeners, you know, might not viewers might not know this, but I'm sure you do from driving your radical and a C1. You can have understeer because you're not on the gas enough. So if you come off the gas in the corner and the car rolls in more than you want, you overload the two tires, you power on and it reduces. So when you start talking on unwind the steering, what is also accompanied is I'll give you a very clear example. I was with my son last year at Sneston going around Corum, long, long right hander in our Clio. And I say to my son, gas, we call it gas to level, gas to level the car. So I said, gas right. to level, gas to level through quorum. And then when we got back in the pits, he said to me, you're telling me gas to level, but I've got the gas on and I am leveling. I thought, okay, let's go again. Yeah. So then I said, have you applied enough gas to compensate for the grip you've generated? Okay. So have you put enough on? So he's like 10%, 20% down. So the car's rolled more and it's starting to overload the left-hand side and the tyres are rolling onto the sidewall and we're starting to nudge into understeer. Now, if he powered on, the understeer would disappear. That is totally counterintuitive if you need to. That, that feels very counterintuitive. There you go. There you go. So you power on. So quite often you find yourself in the car on a track saying, gas, more gas, more gas. Yeah. And then you get back in the pits and the customer says, forget it, I'm not putting more gas yeah, on, I'm yeah. understeering. And then I'll say, are you understeering because you're at the grip limit of the overloaded two tyres or are you truly at the grip limit of all four tyres? Yeah. Oh, I hadn't thought of that. Let's go around again. I'm never going to suggest it if it's going to have us off. Yeah. And then they power on and it goes away. Now, if you keep powering on, you'll eventually be understeering again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So now come back to my map. <laughs> we can layer up again. So there's my, there's my slip angle, man. Right, what are you doing on the gas through two, three, and yeah. four? Is it enough? Is it too much? So let's let's do 10 laps interrogating input on gas because mm. that's going to affect the slip angle map and the characteristic of the car. Yeah. You just keep climbing that mountain. And so, yeah, that's you're probably getting a flavour now for what how yeah, we yeah, do yeah. what we do. And how deep. And it's all... 
it's always engineering based. Yeah, it's yeah, always yeah. putting you in the seat of the engineer, which I love. What do you- one of the things about I did a day with which was actually which was really good with Scott Mansell at Brunting. Yes, yeah. and one of the things I loved about that was it was a. Sh- Unfortunately, I don't think you can use it anymore. Um, but it was a very no, short does. circuit. Yeah. And yeah. what that meant was, yeah, you're not at a big name circuit. You're not in an expensive, fast car. But you, your repeatability, and we could just stop Absolutely. on track. you just be like, stop. Yeah. Let's talk about this whilst you're not driving. Yeah. And then we can carry on driving. Yeah. And we, I've had some really interesting stuff about how the car was balanced through a corner and then also how you were loading it with the steering, et cetera, stuff like that. And the difference, we tried a few different ways of if I was on the throttle a bit more, if I was on the throttle a bit less, how I yep. did the steering and actually maintaining, and it was something I'd not really thought about before was constant throttle and maintaining the car flat rather than yes. being on, like, you know, ramping up or ramping down or whatever. Yeah making it flat and then going through the corner meant that all four tires were slipping and the car felt so stable. It was like a little really tight kind of like chicane type thing. And going through faster and faster, at one point you end up with oversteer, at one point understeer, whatever. But getting it level and doing the same and just whatever it was, a 30 second lap, just playing with that balance. That's the level. The car felt so the bit that was mad was how stable the car felt when you did it correctly and then built up correctly. Because I think yep. I had this view, and I don't have it so much now, that if I get in a car and someone could go, oh, it's a, let's say it's a fast road car, and then you could scale this up to the race car version, like a GT2 RS. I, and let's say a really old school, I don't know, an old school RSR type 911 that's renowned for killing people heavily turbocharged or whatever. And you go, okay, but I'm scared that I'm going to get to the limit and it's going to do this crazy swap end mad stuff. Yeah. And then gradually just I've learned that, you know, you can, you can build up. You don't go, I'm going to take 20 miles an hour faster through that corner. What? And with aero, there's this, I think there's this general perception sort of from formula one, but just, I don't know. It wasn't really engineering based of, you have to go a certain speed for it to work. Yeah. It's, it's just bullshit. Um, but yeah. like, you know, you can go one mile an hour faster, one mile an hour faster, one mile an hour faster, yeah. half a mile an hour faster. You think you're near the end So just go, you know, another two, 1%. Yeah. And doing that rather than people going, you know, you need to break 10 meters later and then you go off the track. And they're like, yeah, but if you're not spinning, yeah. you're not learning. You're like, well, actually, yeah. that gray area of... Being in control, you know, what that with the window you were talking about of the setup. Yes. You know, yes. you can be doing all sorts of adjustments with your steering and your feet. And the end result is your car only goes a foot wider. Or if you're, you yeah. know, really, really, really on it and really, yeah. really good, maybe it only goes an inch, a centimeter, yeah. let's get metric, centimeter wider. And that you've gone, oh, that wasn't quite right. And then you're working on it. That for me was such a like a, an interesting sort of thing to make. That going, you can progress, and it doesn't have to look crazy, and it can be small, no. small, small things. Hundred percent. So we use the phrase incremental increase. Yeah. And engineers live by that, and that again goes back to all our training. So um, you can have a pretty mundane industry pre-production vehicle that is worth 10 million pounds because it's had yeah. two months of engineering content. So what you learn as an engineer is we also change lines. So you can, we, we speak of the evaluation line. So on the handling circuit at Milbrook, we teach the racing line yeah. which for speed. You can't write racing in a risk assessment for an OEM or a provider <laughs> of those services. So we call it the straight and stable line. Yeah, You might use the left lane or the right lane to replicate what the vehicle market is going to be driven in because you might need to okay. work in either. Yeah. And then you could, there's a white line in the middle of the road that defines the track. It's one way. White line in the middle of the road is, engineers would refer to that as the evaluation line. So if you plant the bonnet on the middle of that white line and drive the circuit, you've got a lower latac, you've got, you've got higher latac, so you're cornering at a higher force, but the speeds are lower. And as we always say, you've got room to fall off left and right. Yep. 
So if you get an evaluation car, pre-production vehicle, you can track all its development on a portal normally. But you get in a pre-production vehicle, it'll have the ABS light on, the traction light, the ESP light on, all the airbag lights are on because it's all in development. It's not yeah. been signed off. So you might get in a car and not be quite sure how the latest software status has affected the dynamic of the car. So you can drive the evaluation line at grip limit, mm. and then you're doing it nice and safely. Yeah. And then when you need to do your test, you've done a couple of laps on that line, you've incrementally increased your speed and understand the dynamic of the car. So if you take that same ethos into driving on the track, it's mm. exactly what you've just said. Yeah, I totally get that. Yeah, and that's how we teach because there's no prizes for falling off, is there? No. You don't want to hurt yourself. You don't want to damage your car. So I think there becomes, um, if you get the right advice, there becomes a logical sequence and a process to all this that actually enhances your safety and reduces your risk. Um, and we always speak of risk-increasing factors. Okay. What, how risky is what I'm doing? Those are the phrases we use daily. Yeah. And then you would mitigate that risk with a sensible plan or a risk assessment. And I see racing as exactly the same. You know, we've just had um, a change on the geo. We've got a bit more neggy camber on the rear of our C1. So I've got it at Millbrook now, and I'm probably going to leave here. I've got a report just to finish, and I'm going to pop down to Millbrook and do an hour down there, seeing nice. what difference that makes. Yeah so that I can report back to Matt because we're testing at brands in a few weeks So for brands. So I've got the luxury of that, obviously, because of yeah, what yeah. I do. But I'll just chug around the handy circuit on the evaluation. I go, oh, yeah, that's all right. I'm fine with that. Right, let's push on. But yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, lack yeah. of that, I'm, I'm prepared. So, yeah, I think also what you, you've now touched on, yeah, what you've touched on is it's a formulaic plan. Yeah. So, you know, you think of warming a tyre for, for a race or a track day, you know, how many times you see people just quickly out the pit lane and go? You think, well, a tyre's this thick of rubber. You've got to heat the whole carcass. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've done it myself. I won't put myself on a pedestal, but... Brands you know, is funny laps? for that. <laughs> like, it I've is, ha- isn't it? On I've had it in the yeah. SR3. Like, you come out of the pits on a cold tyres and you've got that first yeah. corner and your back's yeah. just, like, all over the shop trying to get yeah, around it. exactly. <laughs> And then what you realise, if you really study the surface on the exit, that the, the road just dips a little. Yeah. So as you go through Paddock Hill, there is a dip on the left that your left tyres can touch in. And that just kicks you into a hint of oversteer. So, yeah, you could also, you know, there's another conversation. We could be here for hours. But you think of the topography of the road, uphill a car understeer moors, downhill it, over, it yeah. will oversteer more. So if you think then a, a track with changing topography, you might have found mm. out how your car behaves on a flat. Go back to that slip angle map, take those three sections. What does it yeah. do uphill? What does it do downhill? You've got another layer. So it's all incremental, isn't it? You're you're constantly looking to incrementally build. Most of what we've what I've designed into the courses has come from my engineering knowledge. Mm. Um I've worked, which we haven't touched on, but I went to Nissan as a test and evaluation driver, and then right place at the right time. I was offered the job to start the training department, which had never been done before for Nissan Technical Centre Europe. Okay, yeah. So then I got trained by three Japanese specialists who came over to train me, a guy from Spain and another gentleman, and um, that's how I got into driver training. So I cut my teeth and learnt my trade at Nissan Training Engineers, and then I came out into the big wide world on my own. Mm. But that's where it all stemmed from was that, motorsport all my history in motorsport went into nissan learning to test i became a nurburgring pool driver i did some great things um and that then started that like i watched that and actually and the, the skill to be able to how flat like versus the ultimate you know the fastest you can go mm. what what are you aiming to to sort of drive at when you're testing a, a you know a sports car on the nurbo ring it just it just depends on what you're doing um okay. it could be that you're doing durability work uh and you need to drive within a target time of a set lap yeah so it could be you're you're spending three drive three days driving within 10 seconds of a very fast lap yeah uh you could be tire testing a lot of the work that goes on the ring over the years has been validation work for software, okay. ESP systems, traction control systems. Um, we did it as general evaluation work. My department that I worked in were, did general evaluation work on it of all different types of cars and competitor cars. So mine was more uh, fast road, 
and at some times towards grip limit. Yeah. Uh, but I didn't do any over limit riding handling on there. It was all um, whole vehicle evaluation. And do they do um, but, over grip on the Nurbo? Yes, they do. They do. Yeah. <laughs> so if you tie a test, yeah, I've done, yeah, I'll, I'll give you a bit of my knowledge on it. I wouldn't want your listeners to think this guy's a, a, a ringmeister. Uh, I've done 968 laps. Right. That sounds like okay. a few. That's a good number. But I was told when I did my training out there that I wouldn't be competent at evaluating cars until I'd done 500. <laughs> and the man that taught me, Dirk Schwarzman, who's become a friend of ours, Joe and I's, uh, and has worked for us from, from, from time to time, I think when I did my training, he'd done 15,000 laps and ran his own company on there. So when you yeah. go out there, when you go out there and... Yeah, you sit in the tear garden and have your breakfast, and all the manufacturers. You've all got you know got your Nissan gear on, yeah. the Opal guys and the Bridgestone guys, and then I went and had lunch there one lunch time, and there was Harry Vatten and sitting on the table next, you know, next to me. Yeah. So you go out there and you think, mm, this is humbling. Yeah. It's, um, I've just done my training and I've done a hundred laps. No one knows that, do they? But uh, you know it. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I was very humble when I went out there, and I still am. Um, but loved what I did and learned um, significant amounts about vehicle evaluation and testing and understanding it and the processes. It was really very, very informative that set me. And Dirk Schwarzman, I've told many people this, it, it, Dirk Schwarzman was, I did, I went out for my training and then Dirk Schwarzman, who's a ringmaster, he's a guy that runs his, uh, I think he sold it now and semi-retired, uh, uh, but he ran his own driver evaluation test company mm. out there for manufacturers and OEMs and tyre testing and, I did my training with him and then he drove a lap with me sitting in the passenger seat. You drive how we did it. And I think they still do it for industry. You've got a lead car and a passive car. So you follow as, a, okay. as, as yeah. an active driver or you sit in the passenger seat, passive laps watching radios are on my open mic. So, you yeah. know, your instructor dirt was communicating between the two cars. And then as we drove, it was wet and we were in two liter for a primary GTs. And he drove a lap. Bear in mind, I got into evaluation and test. So what you're looking for is an evaluation lap that is uh, whatever G loads, lateral longitudinal loads you're going to use and employ. A lot of the testing is done to engineering manuals. You're doing specific things. And, right, yeah. You know, it's, all, it's, all, it's all very organised. Um, he drove me around in the wet. Bear in mind, I've only just got there. Yeah. And, I, and all I've done, my preparation, here goes, my preparation was to watch Derek Bell in car 956 <laughs> to the point that Joe said, oh, no, you're not watching that again. And I think she knew it as well as I did because, you know, yeah. it's hundreds of laps I watched, so I knew where it went. Yeah. And I'd worked out there around the ring but not on it because there's lots of things that go on around it that people yeah. aren't aware of. Bridgestone tyre testing route. If you go up to Trier on the E42, you've got gradients, long gradients on the autobahn, 7%, 11%, 5%. These mm. are for engine mapping, you know, fuel analysis, fuel burn and things. So there's lots of things that go on out there that isn't just on the ring. But i had done a couple of laps around it after work on a tourist night when it was quiet then in the early 2000s. And then um, I'm now on my training. And then Dirk drove and I watched and I thought, this guy's just driven me around the ring full chat in this car <laughs> without any unnecessary input, like perfection evaluation drive. I read that phrase on your website earlier. No unnecessary input. That, that in like the wet round the Nürburgring yeah. is an absolutely in insane awe. thing to do. <laughs> yeah, so I sat there in awe and then at the end, we pulled into the car park. I thought, how to make an enemy in five seconds. I looked at him and I said, He'd laugh, I have said it to him, he laughs now, but I said, that was amazing. A full lap of the ring in the wet, wet without any unnecessary input on the controls. And he looked at me disdainly and went, of course. Well, like, that's all he said. <laughs> I thought, Christ, I've got three days with this guy and I'll just fucking <laughs> in. But I was so, I was just blown away. Yeah. It was perfection. And you can feel the tyres are working. There's yeah. none of this. No, anything, not one adjustment that wasn't needed wow. or correct. I thought that's what I want to be able to do. So and actually, that's what gave me that gave me so much because yeah. right, if I want to evaluate cars, that's the standard I want to be at. Yeah, there's a level yeah. that I've just seen that has blown my mind that I yes, want to get and to. Not about racing. This isn't yeah. racing. This is 
evaluation and test techniques. And, and he demonstrated it. When he's perfect. doing a lap like that, is he then driving the evaluation line, which is like sort of middle of the road? No, no. Like- it's on, well, what, what, you, what you want to do, which is worth, a, you know, if people are interested, it's worth a little discussion. So if you watch like the Nürburgring 24 hours, yeah. what you'll see is corners, the quickest way to get around a corner on the tight bends is to triangulate them, vector in, yeah. vector out. Whereas the conventional J term, we all learn for track days is yeah. a slower speed unless you're in a car that's heavy like a notchback mustang race car or okay. a gtr prefers that line but what you're looking to is lengthen the corner for evaluation and test purposes so you want to evaluate something you need the longest corner okay so in, a, the in an evaluate biggest window the steady state needs to be the biggest window so that's the line i was taught the conventional line on the racing line but with the longest conventional steady state Okay. for evaluation and test. If you were to race with that line, you'd be quite slow because you made the course a lot longer and you've got less rotation through the platform. But then if you think about um, testing a 911, they're designed to be trail braked because the engine's in the back. So that's what a test Porsche engineers give us is a trail brake car. Yeah. Whereas if you're driving a Primera, it needs to be straight line brake because that's how it's set up for the public. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Should we say in general terms. So... Um, you might take different lines depending on the product that you're evaluating or testing or uh, the task in hand might yeah. necessitate a certain line. Yeah, depending on what you're doing. But, yeah, there's distinct differences. If, you, if you're evaluating test cars, you need another cap on, as I always say, because your racing cap, I, I say this respectfully to all you racing drivers that evaluate cars, but they're the hardest people to train. <laughs> you get racing drivers that are coming to work for an OEM and test yeah. cars, then you've got to undo the racing and get into yeah, the evaluation. Yeah. That's always the hard day, first day. I'm smiling when I say it. I don't mean I'm not being offensive, yeah. but you need to go slower. Yeah. <laughs> yes, like, and you need to lengthen the you need to lengthen the corner. Yeah. Uh, why do I want to do that? The penny always drops eventually, but. Um, yeah, and actually for evaluation tests, you might want a set set of criteria that one corner on a circuit creates. Right, yeah. A racing driver wants to drive a lap. They'll rush around to that corner and yeah. say no. So if I'm going down straight into a corner and the entry for the test is 30 miles an hour plus or minus one mile an hour or half a mile an hour, I could do that at the start of this very long straight. Yeah. Just arrive at 30 plus, well, as a racing driver, or tear up to it, jump on the brakes, and then go to 30 and try miles an to, hour. Yeah. Yeah, so... But what you're very interested in is steady state. Steady state is imperative. Even So like if a, a VCA type engineer is doing a test, uh, a sign-off test for homologation on brakes, when they do evaluation of brake stopping distance, they knock it into neutral and then they brake. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So there's no uh, influence. It's just brakes. So actually you start getting into what we do with engineers, which is around pre-COVID, it was 70% of our business. So it's a big bit of the business mm. and it's coming back now as the OEMs and the providers to those OEMs are coming back to us as they open up again after COVID. But you have to have a completely different hat. Yeah. There's there's transfers of knowledge for racing and track. And we've touched on that a lot on, you know, vehicle development in terms of understanding sh- chassis setup and what have you. But when it's a, it took me... It took me, it was around three, to, I was I was Nissan just over four years and, and every year I learned and I, and I left still learning. Mm. Um, and I've continued to learn as I've been doing this job for 20 years because the, the industry's changed and then you need to keep abreast and understand the tests that are relevant to what industry requires now. So it's a very different field, but very similar. Yeah. But you need to know how to, you know, if an engineer comes through the door or somebody comes through to learn track day work, I always say you're going to learn, you would learn similar skills, but the emphasis might be in very different areas for you to um, effectively carry out the right task. But yeah, the industry side of it just fascinates me. My my passion is driving. I love advanced driving on the road as much as I love everything else I do. So, uh, and I've been like that, you know, ever since I could drive. But the industry side of it is, it's wholly engaging and um, gives you as a coach, um, you know, many challenges because you're working with different departments that need to write yeah. a different thing and you're writing training courses to fulfil the client's needs. And so that side of it, people wouldn't see. You yeah, know, yeah, they yeah. Don't. But the track day, the race is, 
is again racing's a passion. I'm still racing now. I, I haven't touched on it, but I raced power boats for six years and did quite well Woo-hoo! at that. So <laughs> that gave me a, another. Um, I did hydroplanes for six years. Um, and I, I managed to win a club championship and second in the British Championship. Those so I really mad. got into that, and that was yeah. You're lying on a piece of wood that's quite <laughs> real thick. Driving around the water at seventy miles an hour, which was just amazing fun. I could I'll probably do a podcast on that if you're ever interested I, in understanding yeah, think, how powerboats work. I think we might need to do another podcast on uh, yeah, yeah, boats <laughs> and maybe road driving or something. But yeah, but I'm up to it, totally. But uh, I, I think we need to slowly tailor this one towards an yes, end. No problem. Otherwise. No problem. Uh, my editor will be like, yeah. how, sorry, how long is this podcast? <laughs> um, but, okay, let's, 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 let's sort of wind it up. Five, five questions yes. I ask every guest. Okay. Do you have a most memorable driving trip or journey? Um, I've got quite a few, but I, yeah. can, <laughs> I can give you one <laughs> where I work. I'll give you one. I work with my colleague, uh, uh, Paul. We went to the Nürburgring. And we basically, I drove there, he drove back, and we critiqued each other's driving for the whole duration and attempted not to make or minimise mistakes. Yeah. So I think on the road, that is probably the most I've ever concentrated for <laughs> a long journey and sits there as memorable and arduous yeah, at the same yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good fun as well. Yeah. That sounds, sounds, sounds interesting. If you can only drive one car for the rest of your life, uh, and I, re- I need to rephrase this one because uh, every time I say it, I have to qualify it. Basically, you can have a sports car and then you can have a really, really cheap other car that might fulfill some sort of day, like £500 or something yeah. that can you can put stuff in if you need to or whatever. So you've got one car that's unlimited value and then you've got one really, really cheap that you can specify or not specify. Right, okay, that's easy. My van, I drive a Nissan MV200 combi van. Nice. I can get tools in it, tires for track days. I can get customers in the combi section. I can get my fishing tackle in it. So that's definitely, I love my van. Yeah. I've had that for six years now and, and love it. Um, and I think it would have to be a 70s three liter RSR 911. Ooh. Ooh. Because that was my, that was my epiphany into sports cars was at, yeah. was at Auto Farm when I realized how much I love the industry, love cars, love 911s, and was in the place that I really wanted to be. Yeah. And that car, I drove uh, I drove one at Auto Farm, and I've driven quite a few 27 RSs. We used to yeah. service them and restore them, and I've driven three. I've bored many Porsche customers with this statement. I didn't realise at the time how unique this would be, but when I worked at Auto Farm, we looked after three there was only six ever made right-hand drive three-liter RSs, and I drove three of them. Nice. <laughs> nice. We serviced them. I'm yeah, absolutely yeah. good to say that. So that car, yeah. I think, you know, the pictures one wheel off the ground at the Nürburgring yeah, yeah, yeah. over dotting a hoe and all those things. That to me, that was in the era of the 956 Porsches, and to me, that was when Porsche was a younger man who was getting involved in sports cars, yeah. you know, mechanic in technician professionally that i've never forgotten that yeah, yeah. and those that era as well you can 100 percent drive one of those on the road might be a bit intense you can but you, like, you absolutely can. can you can yeah and they even had seats that were not that hard and uncomfortable like the carbon seats we get today in the, yeah. in the gt versions and yes you can you absolutely could it might um, be an expensive way of going from a to b but now but fantastic yeah yeah very that sits cool. right up there in the top five cars in the garage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I always thought the the 2.8 RSR was a better looking car. And then but yeah. over time I, I, I hear that the the three litre was a much better race car and I think it's a much yeah. better car to drive. I mean yeah, yeah I think there's pros and cons. Yeah, pros and cons, exactly. Where where you sit, but um yeah, yeah, they are, you know. They're, Very they're, cool. they're godly cars to me. <laughs> yeah, and what, cool. when you're younger, you're more, um, I'm not saying impressed, but things are more emotive. They stick with you, don't they? Like the poster yeah. car, that's, in my head, that's my poster car. It's before you get jaded. Like, I, 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 I'm I, just so used to just all sorts of, like, <laughs> yeah, hypercar, 
like rubbish that I just see yeah. every day and I'm like you know what that's just another that but I yeah. when I was younger it would be the first time I've seen a, a sports car that sticks in exactly. your mind doesn't it yeah right. most undervalued car at the moment what do you think should be worth more oh okay of I I have a feeling it would be a McLaren MP4 12c because they seem to have sunk good answer I think they sunk like a stone but they are were and still are a highly engineered competent piece of equipment yeah so yeah there you go that that's straight off the top of my head mp4 12c a, fr- a friend of mine has one and he's had it for a long time and if you've had one for a long time basically all the stuff's probably been sorted by now because the whole car will have basically yeah you basically have a new car now <laughs> yes <laughs> but because everything will have yeah. been changed and but fixed. everything relevant but at the time yeah. Yeah, it's like when the Nissan GTR came out, the R35, that was, you know, that, that set everybody on a road to yeah. 1.3G, didn't it? Including yeah. Porsche. Exactly. And I think when the MP4 came out, it was refreshingly different it and was. highly engineered. And you look at yeah. the performance number. So the, my friend's car, like now the shape is sort of, I think it's come into its own now. Like it, it looks yes. really cool now. Yeah. It, did, it looked, just looked a bit weird when it came out. Um, but yeah. The performance even now is mental. Yes. yes. Like new Agreed. stuff coming out now, a 12C yeah. is like as fast yeah. or yep. faster than most stuff. <laughs> yeah. Agreed. Agreed. And it got slated, didn't it? It did. It did. Because it was a bit too quiet and it was a bit too benign in its, yeah. in its sort of emotional experience. But and couldn't do massive skids. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We trained in and you just get in it and you think, oh, no, this is way better than its reputation. Yeah. 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 Right. Most interesting car to you at the moment. What are you Ooh, doing? Looking up. That's, a, that's, that's tricky because, um, okay, although I'm a petrol head, I am into being nice with my grandchildren, still got a planet to live on, yeah. and I'm interested I'm interested in how we are developing – motivation electrically yeah and how the dynamic of the car is slotting into that um i'd probably say something like yeah a lot of people go oh really something like a Taycan turbo s yeah yeah yeah. yeah. i guess that's it. where i probably sit um i drove a Taycan around the handling circuit some months ago and i'm, I'm challenged by how the rebound damping manages the weight at speed because the car feels a little bit un porsche like right but apart from that i'm i'm kind of blown away with what they've done and how they've made a dynamically heavy vehicle behave so well i did i went to it was like a press day at millbrook actually and yep. i took a panamera turbo se hybrid and then a Taycan yep. turbo s around the alpine circuit and yep. i genuinely got out of the Panamera and went, I don't know why you'd buy that over a Taycan. It, it, in yeah. like, as a car to drive, yes. ignoring a uh, yeah, bit of noise and whatever, dynamically the Taycan was so much, just the, the way, the weight, everything, just so yeah. much. I was like, this is just a much Clever. better car. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. And what we realized we, when we train in them, you have to keep an eye on the speed. Though. Normally we mm. can speed sense. Because we do this, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. You don't need yeah. to look at speedo to know where we are with the, the speed and the safety with the client at any one time. Yeah. That kind of comes very naturally. But you have to look at the speedo and the Taycan because you're doing 20 miles an hour more than you think yeah. on, on every circuit. And you look across, you think, whoa, that's 80, not 60. Whoa, yeah. that's 100, not 80. That's what it feels like. Yeah, so yeah, you yeah. have to keep an eye on it. And then you think the sensation of speed, you've managed to give me something that is very heavy, actually... Uh, manufacturers tend to create a fast steering response, which starts to negate weight in terms of its feel. Yeah. So if you've got a heavy car like a K and you want to make it go around a corner, generally manufacturers make the steering rate fast and yeah. that starts to belie the weight. Or like it always pop. Ferrari, everyone thinks they're super, super, super nimble and they are, but yeah. the steering is super fast. So you you've feel like, oh, yeah. it's gone. That's it, exactly. So at some point, the weight jumps out and says, I'm here. Yeah. And it's normally in some kind of directional change manoeuvre, yeah. but the Taycan seems to be able to hang on in there, even though yeah. that some of that weight is masked by engineering, clever engineering. But 
I sit in it and think, yeah, somebody's I not that impressed with the display. I think they may be have put the money into the technology, not the display. Yeah. And what you sit in and view, which is a little bit of a disappointment, but dynamically just I think they're fascinating and clever. Yeah. Very, very clever. Yeah. It is. And it's a it's a very interesting look at how this is the at the moment they have to be really heavy and they have to normally be slightly raised up because of where yeah. they put the batteries and whatever. And you go, okay, like let's fast forward this 10 years and where's this going to be? And I, I think we're going to have some pretty mad vehicles come along. I do, but I also think in order to uh, counter that, uh, Mazda, for example, have put more of a stake in the ground in terms of like, making their cars more just like normal um, IC cars. So yeah. I do what I'm finding interesting. We work with manufacturers. We work with we're contracted to. I won't mention names, but manufacturers of now electrical vehicles, and, yeah. and we teach the engineers. So when you hear where different views and lead engineers on where this is all going, you do get a bit of a, a, a more of an umbrella feel for mm. where things might be going. I, what I found uncomfortable with like Tesla products is they advertise it as a, you know it's got the insane mode button. I think it's called and. You think, well, you're selling me something that you can tell me can go very fast, but it actually doesn't go very well around a corner. No. Or slow the down. Tie can. Yeah, exactly. I need to slow down. But the whole discussion around the product is it's oh, have you massive torque, really fast. Yeah. You know, okay, it's like the going back to the Mustang and the Pontiac GTO days, isn't it? Yeah. Muscle car days. And that, I don't like that. Uh, I find that potentially a high risk zone for an unde- uneducated driver. Yeah. Uh, so I think you're, you're perhaps uh, increasing the risk on the road for us. So I'm not so keen on that. But when I drive a Taycan, I think, oh, no, you've married the performance with a degree of handling that is acceptable for the performance. So, yeah, yeah, that's where I, I'm enjoying that. And the fact yeah. that we're going to have you know, three ton SUVs driven by complete novices that are capable of doing 0 to 60 in three seconds. I mean, that's probably an hour long. Yeah podcast in yeah, itself exactly um, <laughs> yeah which takes us into our daily world yeah, yeah of you know even even down to i'm not giving anything away i shouldn't even risk assessment for manufacturers and the level yeah. of training the engineers have because okay, yeah you've actually gone into they're, they're they're driving evaluating testing developing a conventional saloon car but it's got the performance of a supercar yeah so all our training programs are starting to change because we've got a, you've got to factor that in because you can have yeah. an inexperienced engineer just come out of university on a team and now needs to be signed off to drive the development car. Yeah, That's a different proposition to 10 years ago where it was a 2-litre, 150-horsepower yeah. IC engine so or potentially less. So, yeah, it's opened up our world again. Everything moves on, doesn't it? And you've got to keep moving with it. But. Yeah, I think at one point, the, the the BMW i3, the little small baby BMW, I think that was the fastest production car from 0 to 25 miles an hour. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Wasn't it? And then we had a customer who had it as a pool car, <laughs> and they couldn't understand. The penny dropped eventually while everybody wanted the BMWs, and none yeah. of the other pool cars were being taken. <laughs> yeah, because you've got a hypercar, yeah. you know, sitting there, 0 to probably 60 miles an hour. So yeah. Yeah, How we view that as risk professionally is something we've been geared into for the last three or four or five years. So the training packages have to reflect that risk. Yeah. Yeah. It's an yeah. interesting space. Right. Five car garage. Unlimited value. Well, do you know what? I thought you might ask me this. That is, look, um, just to warn you, I will keep it short, but just to warn you, my friend David, who I race with, we drove to Spa with a cage on the back for a trap day together for a weekend. Yeah. We drove all the way there and all the way back. We started with 20. We got down to 15, then 10. Then we got to five and we struggled <laughs> on five. And that was like, I don't know. Well, now you've got five. Hours. You should just be able to reel it off. Yeah, I should. But the RS, the RS is in there. Yeah. No question. Um, I'm going to go back to my, my, my youth. I could never afford one and wanted one. I bought a Dolomite Sprint because I could afford it, but it would be a mint Mark II Escort RS2000. Cool. So that, that would definitely sit in there because that's a bit of my history. Yeah. Um, it would be probably a 962 or a 956 Porsche because mm. to me that is the ultimate um, Group C car. Yeah. I'm not a really heavy into single-seaters. Um, two more. Uh, a 458 piece that could go in there. Ooh. Normally aspirated. Pre-turbo Ferrari. Oh, yeah, the Speciali, yeah. 
Yeah, especially Ollie. Uh, especially Ollie. Um, Have you got a daily in this scenario? Yeah. In this scenario, probably uh, something like a 993 RS, something like Ooh. that. Ooh. I'd have to have a, a, a daily Porsche, I think. Lots of but Porsches. I think I could do a, I could do a podcast on this because <laughs> when you actually – things like Lancia Delta Integrales, um, you, you, there's been some great landmark, sort of benchmark engineered vehicles that have sort of come and gone but still maintain that sort of – um, that halo effect, I think, something yeah. like a, a large a sixteen valve integral would would sit in there. So, yeah, but I, I always wanted. Uh, I won't gabble on for too much longer. But I, when I was racing minis, the place you got a lot of your spares uh, that was there, not Demon Sweeps, was Rip Speed, mm-hmm. and, and the the manager at Rip Speed in Pinner, uh, he used to race Russell. Somebody he used to race Mini Melia. I can't remember his surname. He's very good at Mini Melia in his day, and then. He gave up racing. He was a manager at Ritzby's in Pinner. And virtually the day they came out, I went to Ritzby's. To, uh, the day this car came out, I was at Ritzby's purchases and bits and pieces to go racing. And outside Ritzby was a bright yellow RS2000. Bear in mind, you know, I'm early 20s. And yeah. I had a white Dolomite Sprint. He gets geeky now. An MT3R. I can still remember the number plate, which was a very good car at the time, but it wasn't an RS2000. And I yeah. couldn't afford one. So that sat with me for years. And I look yeah, at them yeah, now, yeah. they're up to about 30K, but I thought, no, you know, they say don't <laughs> drive your heroes, don't they? So I'll never go back. But at the time, that was the, I don't know, that was the, that that was the, was the Ferrari. One. When you're young, that was yeah. the car to have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so that cool. was definitely would take a place in there. But, yeah, yeah so I'm, I'm, I'm also about experience. Like I'd rather put my money into a C1 and do some racing than just have a car in the garage. Yeah. So... And I'm into engineering, so I do build cars from time to time, and I keep my hand in. Uh, I've got me Austin in the garage that I'm prepping to do a bit of racing. My son doesn't know this, and nor does Joe, but he will know it now. If he watches the podcast. <laughs> I want him to have a race in it. So if he makes it I'm to three hours that. eleven, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he'll be done by ten minutes. Um, no, he's kind of used that. Of course, he'll do three hours. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm about the experience. Yeah. That's why I got into racing. I like to learn new things, and I got into boat racing because somebody, bless her, Joe bought me a day at a power boat training school, and then I thought, well, oh, I'd like to do this. And yeah. the school said, you can rent a boat for a club race. I'll do that. Sweet. I did yeah. that. And then the guy that ran the club, one of the helpers there, or well, the lead guy in it, his daughter has been European champion, Charlotte, and won all sorts of things. He said, oh, I could sell you a boat that will get you going. Oh, yeah, <laughs> let's do that. And it just got worse and worse. You know? I always say to Joe, you're, you're you know, what a lovely thought. A data power boat training school for yeah. birthday and it all went downhill from there for six years. But <laughs> yeah. um but yes, those those are the things I enjoy doing. So I don't necessarily need the car in the garage. Yeah. I like I'd rather be out racing the C one than perhaps shining something on my drive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've always been like that. Slowly yeah, it it comes down to options and what you can do and whatever. But I realised at one point I had a bunch of cars that all basically did the same thing. They were all kind of like uh, okay. slightly sporty yeah. road cars. And and yeah. I realized at one point, I was like, hang on a minute, what are you playing at? Like, if you were going to go into the garage and choose one for a spirited 30-minute drive, and yeah. you go, I could take any of them, you've got the wrong cars in your garage. You should go, I'll take that one. And then you've got one, you go, yes. I'll go what down the motorway. And actually, I want something that's comfy and whatever. And oh no, I don't want to be driving in a stripped out... GT3 yeah. RS for six hours just to go somewhere yes. to go racing. I always think that's funny. Like, yes, yeah. I do it a lot less now than I used to. But like, you okay. know, it's a race weekend or you're going to track day and you're going to drive your race car or whatever. So you turn up in a cool car because like it's kind of fun. Yeah. It's an event, whatever. But yeah. now I get that though. I get that I, as a I, car with you, and yes. I totally yeah. get it. But I'm yeah. way more now like. In, in the yeah. ideal world, I would almost, I would be like chauffeured in the back of a Phantom or something. I'd just get That's in the it. car <laughs> exactly. and turn up, That's right. drive my yeah. race car and then get back yeah. in the Phantom and then I can just shut yeah. off and go to sleep. Not like, yeah. you know, heel turning exactly. into every roundabout. <laughs> yeah. And we, we got a Clio Cup RS 2010 yeah. to 9 at work. That's one of our training cars. And it's on AST dampers. Yeah. And they're they're a good quality, yeah. Quite an expensive damper, and that little thing handles so well, and it's so enjoyable to drive. I've also lost the need for something with a badge. 
Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. I can drive that on track and I absolutely enjoy myself. Yeah. And the actual driving enjoyment is right up there with some of the best because the car, the, the cup chassis is very good anyway. And you put the dampers on. Yeah. And it and it behaves impeccably and it's got excellent feedback and you just balance it with a bit of understeer oversteer on the throttle and yeah. you just come out, you get a bit more and you can and it's turn it on the on the on the throttle and the brakes and it's just a joy to drive. So what I think as I've got older, I've learned to appreciate that more than maybe just I'm driving a Porsche GT three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the engineering of something that works, I believe, is as exciting and entertaining um involving as something that you know really works at a high level so and you can I, remove I, the speed element like you yes can. you're going faster you but actually yeah you know i i would way rather be doing a track day or, or a test day or well, ignoring a race weekend in something that is track prepped and basically can go in the gravel <laughs> yeah <laughs> like you've got it that is way more fun it doesn't matter what yeah. it is c1 yeah not worth very much had- We've had customers that drive 720Ss that have gone into MX-5s, yeah. doggy 911s, and then when you talk to them, they say, well, it was great fun, I really enjoyed it, but I can really enjoy this. Yeah. Because it's not worth so much, and I can find grit in it, and it's you know yeah. equally as challenging. But You yeah, get to challenge ways, your brain. Yeah. Driving around at 70% yeah. is not that fun. And then you're getting overtaken by no. some bugger in a bloody C1, and you're in <laughs> your... Right. 200 exactly. grand Porsche. Yeah, that's right. We, I do find that entertaining in, in a, not in a, uh, as I say, I, hopefully I'm not coming across as rude, but in the wet chasing, you know, 488s eight, eight through cops yeah. in your C1. You just, you can't in, help but smile. In my, yeah. in my radical, and it's, it's kind of cheating in your radical because any road car, any road car is just mince meat, like a, whatever. Yeah. But even then you're like, uh, if there's some, if there's some slow, challenge cars around or yeah. a slow gt3 a slow gt3 yeah. you're like yeah ah, i'm in my like yeah 30 grand here. 40 grand <laughs> radical <laughs> and you're in your 500 totally grand car get that. <laughs> yeah i totally get that and you've bang for buck and commitment in terms of potential loss you can for forty thousand pounds you can have a yeah you know the performance of a 720s can't you so i i do totally understand that but yeah, yeah. It's, i always like fun. the engineering content yes. actually putting something in and then getting something out that is um, exponentially more than yeah you expected to get and that feeling that all oh, this works yeah. really well i wasn't expecting that yeah so that is always a buzz yeah, yeah. and I, i've had uh, it's quite nice road cars and i always do take them to the track occasionally um to yeah. to, to, to explore and you know i want to go explore the limits um before you know, I need to know how a car handles, ideally. Otherwise, yes. I don't feel like I can drive it confidently full stop, really. Because yeah. you don't really what know what's going to happen. True. What you could do, think of the evaluation line. That's mm. what, And that's what we teach clients. In a race car on a track day, you could drive around Cops Corner in the middle of the road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just to experience the car. Check your mirrors, clear behind. I'm going to do a lap in the middle of the road. What does this car do? I've one time to react if something happens unfavorably and I'm not sure how the car's going to behave or it takes me by surprise, I've got a bit of room on the left, a bit of yeah. room on the right, I can jump on the brakes to slow it all down. It's just putting a bit of engineering logic into it. Yeah, and yeah, then yeah. that's what I do in the C1. If I'm not sure, not often now because we've driven them so many times, but you think, oh, I'll just whiz around a few corners in the middle of the yeah. road, see what grip I've got. Right now I'll get onto the full line. Yeah, exactly. Easy. Two or three corners, you just want a bit of safety. We always speak of risk-increasing factors. How can I reduce them? Yeah, you can't take every risk away. Otherwise, we wouldn't be on track. But you can certainly, with a bit of meth, you know, method methodology and a bit of common sense, you can you can piece that jigsaw together sometimes in a safer way. And yeah. and very quickly, if you start to pick up the stuff, like the one I always try and remind myself, if it's you don't know what the conditions are like, you go out and you're like going go reasonably quick, whatever down the straight, and then just give the brakes everything and, and, ex- and you see Absolutely. what on earth is going to happen well done yeah yeah that's my standard if somebody asks me to give them a lap in their car I, I give it a firm threshold break and i rotate the steering i'm probably okay now i might have a little dab on the throttle to see what the response is yeah. right i'm good to go yeah and then and you've then got a lot of knowledge you just exactly in in virtually no time at all yeah, well done. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. I think we need to wrap this up. But 
thank you thank you very much for coming on I, I I've had a whale if there's anyone still listening well done to you I might even split this up into two I don't know um, okay I'm but, happy with whatever you choose to do if, and I also works. have had a fantastic time <laughs> um, and, and I'll say this on air come and have a day with us at Millbrook because I'd, I'd, I'd love, love you to, to experience what we've talked about and I think that would be um I would love you never to know you might even find a little bit of pace in that in that radical oh for sure for sure and even if I don't it's it's some learning I can take away and practice on the yeah. sim and whatever that's it exactly yeah. right well cool. thank you very much thank you Sam cheers thank you very much